So I just wanted to touch on um, being back and being back in school full time has been really nice. Um, I've heard from a lot of different students that it's kind of nice to have Fridays to kind of catch their breath and um, get were caught up on that they need to and my sister at the middle school says that it feels pretty much normal other than masks of course and things like that so really encouraging to see that students are enjoying being back full time and it's feeling more and more normal as as normal as we can have it um the act was a couple weeks ago and that went basically normal and was pretty great for all the juniors who took it we're kind of happy to be <laughs> done with it of course and um last sunday overnight into monday four of us juniors who are in both national honor society and student council went to sartell high school for the state convention of national honor societies and student councils and this is basically just a convention where schools around minnesota get together to talk about new ideas and also elect a new committee of students who plan different events throughout the year and represent all of councils and national honor societies in minnesota um, I was actually elected secretary of the state election um, of the state executive committee for the Minnesota Association of Honor Societies and it, this is conjoined with the Minnesota Association of Student Councils. Um, I am the first student from Farmington so that's kind of fun and I know I talked to you all about election the last at our last meeting so it was encouraging to have that election go well. Um, so on the, this committee, we plan various activities such as summer leadership forums um, and a couple more forums and conventions throughout the year. And we also meet with the School Board Association, Minnesota Association of Secondary School Principals and the Minnesota Department of Education, other things like that to just represent our schools within Minnesota. So that was super fun experience for me to be elected onto that and things like that. Um, this past week we had our mock homecoming week um, as much as we could so it was really fun to have the different events we had color run and an escape room from both National Honor Society and Link Crew and on Friday we had our coronation which was super fun um, I got to MC for that so that was great um, there was a lot of senior class members and family members to be present to watch our 20 different court members of the senior class play games and carry out the usual tradition of um, homecoming coronation. So Mason Mortimer and Odosa Amadison were crowned king and queen, so that was super fun. And um, yeah, homecoming week was a success. And the last kind of thing that I was gonna touch on, and I know Mr. Berg already mentioned it, was speech and sections were April 15th. And out of our whole team, 11 people broke into the final rounds, which was really amazing. And there was four great girls who moved on to the state competition this past weekend, who are Ashlyn Cox, Sophia Trinary, Kylie Snowbeck, and Kat Cruzy. So kudos to them for making it to the state competition. And I know they um, did well there, so. Yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Very enlightening. You guys covered a whole plethora of information <laughs> from different rounds of school. I appreciate that. And as always, if there are events that you're helping with, like you mentioned, the walk for Best Buddies, send them to us so we know, or send them to Mr. Berg to send to us, because I know we like to help out with those things as well. If you need any help or fundraise or anything like that, let us know, okay? Because I'd, I'd love to participate if I can. Also, Grace, congratulations on yes. being elected to that. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. That's big deal. Thank you. All right, now I think we're to the consent agenda. The consent agenda is made of routine business items that can be acted upon with one motion. If any board member wishes to discuss an item, they may request that it be pulled from the consent agenda and will be acted upon separately. Does anyone have an item they wish to discuss? Okay. Not seeing any. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve this consent agenda as written. Second. Motion by... Coletta, second by Carrero. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The consent agenda passes. All right, now we got a change of the guard up there. Our first item for reports and communications is the prom, the prom and graduation planning update with Mr. Busman and Mr. Pickens. Madam Chair and board members, thanks for having us this evening. We're a couple of weeks delayed from when we uh, initially had hoped to present, and so there are a few slight changes to what we have included in the board packet, but we're prepared to talk about that. Um, this coming spring was something that we have been thinking about since the events of last year that we could not hold in person. And we knew how especially important for our outgoing group of seniors that some semblance of a prom and 
our desire for an in-person graduation was, and that's been something that we've really been thoughtful about this entire time. Um, and so as we think about all of the reiteration about safety guidance within schools, all of these are about trying to get to that graduation event because it is so monumental in students' lives. Um, as we prepared for this, we kept hearing from the Minnesota Department of Health that they were gonna release prom and graduation guidance and prom and graduation guidance. And then they said, okay, we're ready to release it. And they gave us venue guidance. They gave us guidance around, well, really you think about the space that you're gonna use will give you a calculator that you can kind of use to determine how many people you can have in your space. Um, and that was kind of it. We all sat around and looked at each other and said, that was it, we've been waiting for a month for this. Um, nevertheless, that's what they gave us. Um, a few things that did come out of that is that uh, they did indicate that regardless of the indoor or outdoor nature of your event, masks were gonna be required of participants. Um, so that is something that we still have to plan for. They had also indicated that in both situations, we need to be mindful of pods, and we'll talk about how that looks different for both prom and for graduation. Um, and as we know, right, it, when we've had uh, graduation events where weather has really challenged it being an outdoor event, any indoor event is gonna seriously compromise the number of people that can participate in a safe manner. Um, and that's been a guiding factor, is that when we think about some of the things that we've put out there, such as alternate dates and times for the graduation ceremony, it was just to be mindful of, let's maximize the number of people that we can get to this event, even if there is a factor of inconvenience by postponing it a day um, to a different time. So I'll turn it over to uh, Dan Pickens to talk a little bit about prom first. All right, well, again, thanks for having me. Um, prom has been, um, it's been on my mind a lot. I've spent a lot of time uh, working with uh, Manny Salisbury, who heads up our um, prom committee. And while graduation continues to be my priority, having an in-person graduation ceremony with spectators is my number one priority. Um, prom is a, is a close second, wanting to give our, our students, especially our seniors, um, some kind of an opportunity this year. Um, so we've been, Maddie and I um, spent a lot of time thinking about what's, what makes prom so special for, for our students. And one of those things that, that rose to the top really quickly was just getting dressed up and doing some fun stuff with your friends. The Grand March is something that people talk about a lot. And beyond that, the, the actual dance and that ceremony is fun, but it's really the, the Grand March is, is what, what many students really like to, like to participate in. Um, so um, I don't know if we have Grand March on here too, but either way, well, I'll talk about Grand March now. So we are going to, May 14th is the, is the date that we um, chose um, for graduation. That is a Friday. Um, one of the reasons that, and, 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 I'll, and I'll go back and talk a little bit about um, what we've done in the past, but one of the reasons that we chose May 14th, we bounced around a couple of dates. Originally, we had moved it back to, um, I want to say, May 29th, and that was mainly because we wanted to, that was before the guidance came out, that was when they were saying, there's going to be guidance, there's going to be guidance. We wanted to push it back as far as possible to give us more uh, of an opportunity to be able to do something, because at that point, we didn't know if we were going to be able to do anything. Um, once we got the guidance, we wanted to separate it a little bit from um, graduation um, and allow for a lot more than more than 14 days in between those two events. And also the venue that we chose, um, May 14th, uh, was the date that they had available. Um, so back to Grand March. Um, Grand March is going to be on May 14th. It's going to be um, fairly typical as far as from a student's perspective. Um, they'll come in here, it's actually gonna be filmed right in here. It's gonna be no spectators allowed at Grand March, but it'll be live streamed. We're gonna make it very, very special for those that um, choose to attend. It'll be open to juniors and seniors. Um, and if they have, um, if they're bringing a date or they're being accompanied by an FHS sophomore, they can do that too. Um, no outside um, no outside guests for our Grand March or our, or our prom will be allowed. Um, students will come in here, they will we'd live stream, like I said, we'll have a little MC um, introducing all of, the, all of the people doing it, and then um, out in one way, out the other way, socially distance, uh, masks, and all that kind of stuff. After Grand March, uh, originally, um, we were going to have it be a senior-only prom, and that'll be at the Gardens of Castle Rock. I don't know if you've ever been down there, but uh, I went and visited for the first time the other day, and it's a really, really cool place down there. 
Um, it's a little bit smaller. It'll be more of an intimate setting, um, but we think it's we can we're able to kind of spread the kids out a little bit, make it a really special thing. Um, one of the kind of cool parts about prom this year, it'll be a, a silent disco. Um, if you if you haven't heard of those, essentially you have uh, multiple different types of music. When you get there, you get these headphones that are colored and kind of fun, and you can choose which type of music you're going to listen to. So there's three different DJ booths, and you choose which music. So from an outsider's perspective, if, if I'm there without my headphones on, everybody's like kind of dancing and moving, but there's no sound, right? Because everyone's got their headphones on. So it's kind of a kind of a, un a cool and unique experience. Um, we're also going to have, you know, lots of other activities um, and for, for students to participate in at the actual uh, prom. So we started out with seniors only. Um, now we're um, opening it up. I'm going to send an email out tomorrow morning. Um, that's going to be opened up to juniors <coughs> and seniors if they would like to participate in that um, with a max of 250. That's the venue, uh, venue maximum. Um, seniors will have priority on that. Um, we're going to have until the end of this week or Sunday the 2nd to sign up and purchase tickets for for that prom. Um, yeah, that's probably. I think some organizing factors that came with prom is that they have to be in pods of no greater than six, yep. and pods must not interact. So they can see each other from six feet away, but in theory, they're not supposed to um, interact as part of that. And so that's why we did kind of target an outdoor event because it felt like it gave us some more flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, also by moving it to May 14th, it did prolong the amount of time between when prom and graduation would take place should there be any type of transmission that would happen just as part of uh, social connections and whatnot. So we're excited to see what, um, mm -hmm. what the reaction will be by opening this up to juniors mm -hmm. and potentially sophomore guests today. Yeah, I've been working with the um, principals of the South Suburban Conference. We meet um, every couple of weeks and we try to coordinate some of these things to make sure that we're all kind of on the same, same page. Um, most, pretty much every school is offering some kind of a grand march. Uh, most of the other schools are stopping it at Grand March and just saying kids can do what they're going to do on their own um, and just doing a Grand March. Some are doing things similar to this, um, so we're right on pace, actually offering probably a little bit more than the rest of our, our neighbors um, around here for as far as prom. Now, it, it, and it's, been, it's been tricky. It's been hard because just from the, the point from when you made this presentation to now, we already have changes. So that's how quickly things are changing. I'm sure there'll be some more changes and updates between now and May 14th. But um, you know, hats off to Maddie Salisbury. She's been working um, really, really hard at, at providing an opportunity for our kids. And we're, we're excited to be able to do something. So we'll year. pause and ask if you have any questions regarding prom. Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. Do you, working with the prom committee, do you have like an idea of how many kids you think will t attend? I mean, have you have kids? Uh, Shown interest, I guess. Yeah, not. Um, it hasn't been as high as, as what we would have liked it, which is why we're opening it up to juniors. Um, but we think some of that is, um, with it being a senior only. You know, if, I'm thinking back to my experience in high school. If, um, if if you have a date that's from a different grade level, that could be like, why would they want it? So I, I guess there's a, some of that going on too. So hopefully, by opening it up a little bit, we'll we'll see some more people that that will attend. Um, if, if, uh, if we don't get the numbers that um, we need to, then we may not be able to um, host that part of the event. Grand March is, is free and it's going to happen no matter what, um, if, you know, barring something <laughs> bad <laughs> happening. But, um, but the actual problem, we need to get up to about 150 or yeah. so to be able to make yeah. that happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Anyone else? Um, Madam Chair. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering uh, a couple questions, actually. Is it fully outside then, the whole event? Yep. Okay. Yeah, there's some um, uh, there's some cover, uh, um, like, what do you call them? Canopies? Yeah, like pergola type things. There's some of those around there, but it is fully outside, yeah. Okay, so if there is inclement weather, what's the, is there a backup plan or? That's, that's a good question. No, there's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to okay. be beautiful that day. Yeah, okay. Um, and then is there any other music other than the silent DJ or is everyone going to be like required to wear like the headphones if they want to? We're still playing around with that okay. a little bit. Maddie, Maddie, when I met with her today, she was thinking about wanting to do, um, maybe doing like two of the silent disco things and then having some other music. So um, some of that stuff's still being discussed. She's got a couple of um, prom committee members. She's bouncing some of those ideas off of too. Okay, so. perfect. Thank you. Hey. Anyone else? You guys answered my question, so thanks. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, well, we're off to, uh, to graduation, and as we had planned before, right, June 4th has been on the calendar for quite some time. 
with the 7 p.m. Uh, ceremony. And as we calculated the venue guidance, right, we're fortunate that um, we've got the facilities we do. We really are. We've got such an enormous amount of space out there um, with Tiger Stadium, with the bleachers, with the field, with the hill, that we really feel like we can provide this in-person event, um, hopefully with the sun shining during the entire time. Yes. Um, we do know that um, guests were going to be an important part of this equation. And so we initially started off thinking we're going to guarantee two tickets per graduate, um, but we feel fairly confident that we can expand that to four with the way that we're going to organize. And so we are going to see some shifting with how we have done graduation set up in the past, where oftentimes the stage was set up with its back to the east facing the home stands. But we feel like if we can shift that and have the back facing the high school with the backdrop, and having graduates on the field spaced out by three feet that we can utilize both sets of bleachers including additional space behind the graduates to try to maximize um, up to four guests per graduate and i say that because oftentimes there can be some trading of tickets behind the scenes and easily accomplished um, we need to pod family family units by a graduate together we're still working through what the details of that might be but again, as we took a look at a lot of graduation plans from other districts, we feel really solid about the fact that we can get four um, in-person guests as part of that outdoor event. Um, in all cases, the event will be live streamed, um, which we heard from many people last year was a popular feature that uh, they didn't necessarily have to be on site. Um, we didn't want that to be the only option, but it is a, a very good option. People will not be able to be in Farmington High School in the recital hall or the commons to, to view the live stream. They'll need to be able to kind of do that from home. Um, our facility will be fairly locked down uh, for guests only um, as part of that. And um, I'll let Dan talk a little bit about uh, the organization and then kind of why we came up with some alternate um, event times. Yeah, and one of the other prior, um, priorities that we had was we heard this from students a lot that they wanted to graduate together um, because we talked about some options of doing multiple small graduations which is what some schools have decided to do um, but we went away from that and and really wanted to get all of our class of 21 uh, 2021 together out on the out on the field um, graduating at the same time so that was one of our priorities another one of the reasons that we went to this um, in the past, what we've done is we've had a, um, a graduation, graduation time and date set, and we hoped that it was going to be outside, and we've been pretty lucky the past few years that we've been able to have that outside um, other than last year. But if, the, if there's weather coming in or storm or something like that, we've just moved it to the inside. And, um, and that's, that's uh, been something that we've done um, for as long as the school has been open. Unfortunately, with this year, if we have to move it inside, then according to that calculation that we have from the state, we wouldn't be able to have any spectators in there. P pretty much takes us to the max with all of our graduates in there and then the staff that need to work it. So rather than just accepting that fact and saying, if we have to move it inside, there's no spectators allowed, um, that didn't sit well with me because um, I don't want the rain to come and us to not to have another option. So um, rather than having a, a backup location, we chose a backup date. Um, and the, the next day right after that seemed like the best, the best date for us to choose if we're already going to have things set up outside uh, and everything already, because that's a pretty significant setup um, when, we, when we go to set up um, for graduation. So the first alternate that we chose was 11 a.m. the next day on June 5th. The second alternate being 6 p.m. On, on June 5th as well. If neither of those date, or if, if it's raining or it's storming throughout all of those times, then the third backup will be to move it inside and live stream it and have graduates only. Um, obviously not a priority, but again, one of our priorities was to have a class of 2021 graduate together in the same spot, and we're still, still able to accomplish that um, it, with, with all of these plans. So we can all cross our fingers and we can hope for good weather like we do every year and this year even more so because of, of what's at stake here. But I'm actually really excited about, um, about setting up this year. I think that it's going to look really, uh, really nice with, with the school in the background, with the stage facing the north, um, just packing that place, um, socially distanced with our families. I think it's just going to be, it's going to be a really wonderful celebration for our, for our class of 2021 that has been through a lot. and. Um, you know, we're going to we're going to do everything we can to, to make this happen and for for not only our graduates, but for their families as well. So 
Um, every, every decision that we're making between now and then, including with our, some of our decisions on prom, um, has been to make sure that we can host an in-person graduation ceremony um, with spectators um, outside. So that is our priority. And it may mean that we need to sacrifice some things along the way, um, including maybe hanging out with our friends or, you know, we need to make, make smart decisions with what we're doing. And um, a couple of those things, I'll just kind of go off topic here. We have a couple of uh, senior awards um, ceremonies that we do towards, towards the end of gradu or leading up to graduation. And uh, we're gonna be hosting those virtually this year. So the Distinguished Scholars Banquet and also the senior awards um, where we get the scholarships. Those are all gonna be virtually. Um, and part of that, the reason is because we don't want a week before graduation to be pulling a bunch of people together um, just in case something were to happen. So um, those are some of the sacrifices we make in order to have an in-person graduation for, for our class 2021. So any questions about graduation? Just a comment, Madam yeah, Chair. Thanks everybody, all their effort putting this together. I think it's amazing what you guys have done. Uh, my daughter graduates in two weeks in college and she doesn't get anything like this. Mm. So I commend every everything that you guys, all your decisions based on what the students want. Mm. So nice work on that. Thank you. Looking forward to it. It's the best part of being on the school board is, mm -hmm. is that graduation day. Yeah, I agree. So nice work. So my question is, you're saying that indoor is the last resort. Would that time be the 6 p.m. on the Saturday? Is that what it would be? Yeah, good question. Yep, exactly. Okay. 6 p.m. On, on that Saturday would be. The and the setup, how early is setup done? Because like, I need, could it be like if there is some rain, but it's going to be nice to the ceremony, everyone bring a towel or something to sit on, or how does that work? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this year more than any other year, uh -huh. um, we will make it work outside, even if it's a little bit wet and, and stuff like that. It would have to be, um, you know, pretty bad for us to not have that thing outside. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and again, we're sticking with Friday night, right? And if it's a little yep. bit wet, it's going to be a little bit wet. That's yep. our preferred target. Right. But if, yep. if it's inclement weather and we just it's not safe, then we'll shift it. Yeah, so we're going to be setting up this year um, earlier than we have in the past just because it's going to be a brand new setup for us. Um, so we would most likely have two setups if we have one inside and one outside, potentially. Um, so that way we can make that decision a little bit more last minute than we have had to in the past. So. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks for all the updates. Yeah. Lots of planning lot of that's still happening. So. <laughs> a lot of yeah. <laughs> all right, thank you. <coughs> all right, next item of business with the reports and communications, item B is our 2021-2022 budget update with Jane Huska. <laughs> Madam Chair, Board Members, Superintendent Berg, members of the community, I am here tonight to further our conversation about our FY22 budget. So we'll take a look at it at a federal level, a state level, and a local level. All right. Oh, we'll get this. I'm not a math person, so. Uh, so if you all can remember, back in November is when we got our first forecast from the state. And when they came out, we were looking at a $1.3 billion deficit. And four short months later, our February forecast, we were looking at a $1.6 billion surplus. Now, most people will think, well, how can you have a $3 billion swing in a matter of four or five months? And really, it, it comes down to three basic things. One, our revenue came in greater than projected. Two, our expenditures were less than projected. Unfortunately, that was on the back, large back of education because our enrollment was down, our public student count was down, and human services. But the biggest piece to this puzzle was the influx of federal funding. Now, you have to take that with a grain of salt because as you know, it's one-time money and how is that gonna impact our state budget as we go down the years? Uh, so they're taking that into consideration and anytime you get one-time funding, it's also a slippery slope. So you really need to pay attention to that and your spending. Um, and at the time I put this together, I, there are six weeks left. They have a little over three weeks left to pull everything together. 
It's very interesting because what the governor and the two, repre um, two different segments uh, have put out there are totally different. Uh, and as we look at it, the governor's proposal, he has an increase on the gen ed formula. He has some funding for pre-K and school readiness, uh, funding for special education, the cross subsidy, he wants to keep it flat. And he had introduced a $13 million increase for early uh, or for English learners. There is a cross subsidy for English learners and it has been for years and years. And it's nice to uh, that they acknowledge that we have a cross subsidy for our English learners. And the last one has to do with property tax equalization. Now that doesn't necessarily mean the district will be getting more money. What it means is, is that there could be a shift in levy and aid. So remember, levy comes directly from our taxpayers, aid comes directly from the state of Minnesota. So it could just be that our taxpayers could see a relief, but really maybe not the district as a whole, okay? As we look at the, the Senate side of things, they had the lowest amount coming forward for education, no increase in gen ed, they have a one-time allocation of $60 million that they're calling the classroom aid that they are pushing forward. And it's, they're, currently they're having it allocated as our federal funds, which isn't the greatest. They really, really need to get off of that, um, but we'll see what happens. No funding for the cross subsidy for special education or, or English learners, which just means it's gonna to continue to grow, which means it continues to pull out of our gen ed funding. So that's unfortunate. Uh, increase in equalization, again, that's an aid and levy switch, so not necessarily more funding for our district. Uh, they do have in there though, a bigger flexibility with using distance learning in future years. So that would be nice for districts. Safe schools, again, aid and levy. And they have interesting direct funding for non-public schools. So we'll see where that goes. The House does not have that in there. So I don't think that will move forward. The House came forward with the biggest option. They have 2% on the formula for 22 and 23 plus, and I've never seen this, a 0.5 increase two more years out for FY24 and 25. Plus they want to, add an inflationary factor for FY26. So they're shooting for the moon there. Highly doubt that that's ever gonna pass, but I like, I like their thought process. They're looking to hold um, special ed cross subsidy at its current level, and they wanna reduce the cross subsidy for English learners. And they have a three-prong approach for their English learners, so even if one of them get, comes across, that'll be beneficial for us. Uh, they are moving forward that they want the boards to be able to renew operating referendums by a school board vote if there's no increase. If it's just the same, if it's the same $500 that you're trying to renew, they're seeing if they can get that pushed through where it would just be a school board vote. And for distance learning, they've only extended it for one more year for FY22, and that is it currently. As we switch over to the federal side of things, we had our CARES 1 funding come in in FY20, just at the beginning of our pandemic. And the funding came in three different buckets, GEAR, ESSER 90% and ESSER 9.5. Uh, we roughly received $430,000 and we used that funding for our long-term subs that we have in each of our buildings and for some tech technology. We need to spend that money by September of 22, and we'll have no problem spending it by then. <laughs> um, then in December of 20 came CARES 2. And it took a little while for the districts to get that money. It was hung up at the legislature. They are using it as a pawn, and they finally released it. It will be, we'll be able to use it for the same uh, expenditures and CARES 1 and we know our ESSER 90% we're getting about 1.3 1.4 million dollars the other two buckets the gear and ESSER 9.5 um, aren't known at this time because it's going to be tied to summer school and they just ask districts for what they are projecting for enrollment 
they're kind of thinking that it's going to be four dollars per student for that so we'll see how that goes and that needs to be spent by September of 23 again we're not going to have an issue spending those dollars whatsoever and then we had CARES 3, and that just came out recently. Preliminarily, um, we are estimating that we're going to get about $3.2 million. $3 million of it is going to be tied to our ESSER 90%, and uh, the other two buckets are GEAR and ESSER 9.5. We're not quite sure what they're going to do with that yet. The legislature has that money kind of tied up. They have it uh, tied to a lot of different bills that they're trying to push forward. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that as it comes down the pipeline. May, now, I, ask, may I ask a question before you go on? Sure. What were the stipulations to those federal programs you just went through? Were, the, it, were there stipulations with what we could spend it on? You mentioned the subs and the technology. Oh yeah, there's, there's a laundry list of things okay. that we can spend it on. Um, for S or for CARES 3, we're still waiting to hear on supplement or supplant. Um, so supplement means that it has to be spent on all new programs. You okay. can't use it for anything that you're currently doing. Where supplant means that you could. So like we, we have a budget deficit, and if we wanted to use that to patch oh. some of our holes, we could. Okay, yeah. that'd be useful. Yeah. It, it is because when they start talking about supplement, yeah. when districts across the state are, are reducing, yeah. you have one time money. I mean, you're just going to add something for a year, maybe yeah. two years, and then reduce that along with your other things. It, it really doesn't make much sense. In Not theory, very helpful. It does, but <laughs> where everybody is, it doesn't. So. Okay. Thank you. Yep, and more than likely, we're going to be able to um, surplant, but we're just waiting for the final guidelines to come out that actually says that we can. Been in the business long enough that when there's a carrot, there's strings attached. So. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, and so this funding actually is available to spend till September of 24. And so just with our 90% ESSER, we have talked as a group that we were really would like to spend about a million dollars each year. So that actually gets us through the FY24 school year. So as we're looking and projecting out, we're gonna try to hold a million dollars for each year so it can help with our long-term planning. As we look at a local level, if you can recall, we, when we set our budget parameters, we thought we were being very conservative with the 7172 enrollment, which was the same enrollment that we used for the 1920 school year. And I've been here since 2004, and we have never had a decline in enrollment. Unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to be able to say that anymore. Uh, when we look at our enrollment, and this is just estimate, right? We still have some students out there that we don't quite know where they're at and whatnot, but just looking at January 11th, um, we were down 222 kids. And when you look at an average class size of 25, you're losing about nine FTE. Uh, at about $75,000 per position, you know, that's $675,000. And then we have the five superintendents reserve at 75, that's $375,000. And the other thing, unfortunately, uh, our kindergarten numbers are coming in really low this year. Now, last year, we were probably one of the only districts in the state uh, where our kindergarten numbers actually came in higher than what we had projected. And I'm not talking hundreds higher, right? Uh, but uh, it might be our turn this year where we're not going to see our kindergarten numbers come in. So we had reductions in that area as well because our, our numbers just aren't there. As we move on to class size, in February we came to you with our budget parameters where we discussed that we would like to increase class sizes in grades 2 through 12 by 1 to help with our budget deficit. As we got our CARES 2 money and we saw that we were getting $1.4 million, we decided as a group that we would like to reinstate those class size. So we're not going to increase by one, and we're going to reinstate those FTEs back into the classrooms. Also, we won't be 
looking at the specialists at the elementary. We're going to leave them whole for this year. Uh, but we're all, we might have to look at them a little differently and what they're going to do and how they maybe are going to help support our distance learners or support our kids in the classroom. So we'll just see how that goes. So that left, roughly leaves still $700,000 left in our CARES to, to spend yet. Okay. And then we took a look at other budget considerations um, district wide. I'm not going to go through them. It basically totals up about $832,000. So that leaves us with roughly 733, 700 to a million dollars, I'm going to say, left. Because the 733 doesn't take into consideration the reduction in kindergarten enrollment that we're seeing. So we've had conversations back and forth. We still have some other things that we're looking into to consider as budget reductions, but we're also talking about using our CARES money to backfill our budget so we don't have to make any further reductions in our budget and our positions. So we're kind of doing the wait and see what the legislature does and how everything falls out and so as we do that you know we're we're wondering about enrollment you know how is our enrollment going to actually pan out uh, will any of those kids come back that left will if you guys have driven around the district at all you've seen houses upon houses are going up in our developments and are we going to see any kids come in from those developments state funding the, uh, the Senate is the only place that doesn't have an increase for our gen ed, populate, or our gen ed formula. So just a 0.5 increase is $450,000. So that makes a big difference for us as well. And our CARES 3, we just need to make sure that they put that language in there that we can um, supplement or we can surplant uh, our current budget needs and roll forward with that and con continue with our long-term planning. So does anyone have any questions where our budget is sit sitting? Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Jane. This is really helpful. I always appreciate how clear-cut you make it and it's easy to understand. Um, on the slide just above this one, so these uh, budget considerations are potential savings that could be realized if needed, but nothing proposed or concrete at this time. These, this $832,000 we're actually doing. Okay. Yep. Again, for sure. Yep. That was my only question. Yeah. yeah. Just so people kind of get a broader picture, when we talked about this, and we originally talked about the plus one staffing ratio, that would have a pretty big impact, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it, it about eight and a half FT that we were able to reinstate back through CARES money. Um, and so when we look at it, you know, Jane talked about $733,000 to a million dollars. If we were going to make those reductions, we're talking programs, we're talking additional people and things like that. And since we got, and since we've got more information around our CARES two and have about $700,000 left, we just thought that coming off of the year that we just came off of going into a year that is a little bit unknown for the things that Jane talked about, right? We haven't had an enrollment decrease since 2004. I mean, we joke around that it could be quite possible that in a year, year and a half from now, our enrollment is leveled out and it's the normal of now. We could also be talking about, we don't have enough room, right? I mean, if, if these houses continue, so we're just in a weird spot. And since we have the ability to, um, supplant with uh, those federal funds to take a year get our feet underneath us and really make some you know really make some determinations if we have to make some systematic changes based on enrollment being down or some of these other things and with that still having some help from that three million dollars of federal funds um, to help maybe soften that if we have to but it gives us a better chance to get our feet underneath us after just a really different year so. Okay, you have one more follow-up question. Mm -hmm. For the district staff development piece, can you talk a little bit about what that looks like? Just because knowing with everything that our educators and staff have been through this mm -hmm. last year and how much professional development means to 
people growing in their yeah. growing and feeling satisfied with their employment. Can you just talk a little bit about what that looks like in terms of that reduction? Yeah, absolutely. So each year we have staff development dollars that we set aside. It's two percent of our gen ed formula. But what happens is is you can also roll it over each year. So it can go into a fund balance specifically for staff development. And so due to the last year, well, let's say 15 months of not having a lot of professional development where we're sending people off to conferences, we have a nice fund balance sitting in staff development. And so it was, this is the district staff development that we're putting forward, not the currently, not the ones going out to the sites because we have enough in our fund balance, we believe for this next year, for people to go to conferences or get the professional development that they need. Yep, yep. I guess I have a couple questions. The heating and cooling set points, is that what I'm assuming, just turning the temperature down or up depending on the time of the year just to save a little bit? Yep, okay. All right, I think that's all I've got for questions for myself. Did anyone else have any questions? Just pulling the board here students have anything all right thank you for the update appreciate all, right, all you. of your crystal ball assumptions <laughs> as you go with it you gotta keep shining it i know i know fogs up with the masks right all right um, item C is the facility use fee schedule adjustments for fiscal year 2022 and 2023 with mr dan miller uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Chair Saucer, members of the board, Superintendent Berg, uh, members of the community. Um, as you might recall, um, probably about two years ago, um, we uh, kind of began a, a task of reevaluating um, our, at that point in time, existing fee structure for um, our outside user groups. Um, and as you are probably aware, our facilities are, are used very, very heavily um, by outside user groups, which is, which is great. We've got great facilities here in this community, um, and we're, we're happy to uh, you know, bring outside user groups in. Um, at that point in time, um, we were noticing a, a pretty significant uh, budgetary shortfall uh, when it came to the fees and fee structure that we were utilizing based upon the expenditures um, that we had in terms of uh, bringing folks in uh, to do that work and maintain our sites. So at that time, uh, two years ago, we, we made some pretty significant adjustments um, to our fee schedule, um, did some uh, adjustments of those kind of permit and administrative fees pieces, um, as well as those hourly uh, charges in many areas, not all, um, but many areas saw at least a bit of an increase. Um, some of them, uh, from a percentage standpoint, um, were, were probably larger. Uh, when you, for example, if you were to go from 50 cents an hour to $3 an hour, um, from a percentage standpoint, that was a pretty significant you know, percentage increase um, you know, for some of, some of these groups. Um, at that point in time, uh, we had also uh, worked very uh, closely with uh, uh, Mr. Cheetah and the activities um, athletic um, office. Uh, his office, for the most part, does most of the scheduling and management of the facilities. Uh, and at that point in time, uh, we, we had some uh, significant discussions about trying to minimize uh, the significant impacts that this could have to outside user groups if we continued along the path of making large adjustments you know every five to ten years versus trying to have continuous smaller adjustments incremental adjustments that people could be planful for uh, and count on um, you know as our youth associations are going out and and doing uh, you know registration if they can plan for a you know two and a half to three percent you know every year or five percent every couple of years and count on that then they at least they know um, and so at that point in time that's kind of what we had um, the conversation that we had uh, internally as well as with the board uh, and so for lack of a better way of putting it um, what you see here uh, before you is uh, is basically that um, an adjustment of five percent 
uh, over uh, a two-year period. Um, we had kind of discussed at that point in time, leaving things, kind of making adjustments every two years um, and, and changing those uh, hourly uh, fee structures. You'll notice that uh, we are not proposing uh, any of the, the ch any changes to the kind of the permit or administrative fee uh, types of pieces um, with this. It's kind of that hourly uh, type of rate thing, you know, kind of as a tangent. I know that you've heard, you know, from some budgetary, you know, types of pieces that, you know, our, our annual types of roll-up costs and so on and so forth are, are still higher than this. I'm not going to sit here and, and tell you that that we're even at a break-even point, um, you know, with these. Um, it probably wouldn't be accurate. Uh, the other challenge is that, unfortunately, we've, we've spent the last, you know, 13 or 14 months in a very atypical time frame. And so in order to get accurate historical, you know, numbers and data uh, to see how the changes that we made two years ago, um, you know, have consistently impacted our kind of our bottom line. Um, not, not, not something that uh, I, I would feel comfortable saying that you know we've been able to do because it has been anything but typical the last 14 months. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I guess you know with with that. Um, Quite frankly, I mean, all all the numbers that are, are on there would be a, a five a five percent increase um, to those uh, hourly fees over the the FY20 numbers, and then those would be uh, in effect for uh, FY22 and 23. So next fiscal year and the following, and those would represent a five percent increase. So I guess with that, I would take any questions that folks have. Oh, one other thing I suppose that I should uh, note, because I just had the conversation with one of the youth uh, groups here um, in the past couple weeks is one of the other things that we wanted to attempt to do with some of these uh, fee increases, um, while we very much um, appreciate partnering with our outside user groups and our, and our youth athletic associations, um, it's, it's kind of a balance in terms of, you know, these are our facilities that, you know, we want to take ownership of and we want to maintain um, and, and don't want to rely, you know, on outside user groups to, to kind of provide that base level of, of uh, you know, quality facilities. Um, and, and, there, and we were a little bit out of whack with that in terms of, you know, the youth athletic associations were, you know, kind of making donations and so on and so forth and improvements. Um, to kind of do some things that we thought really we should be doing, but we didn't have the funds to do it. Um, and so we're trying to get some of that stuff back in balance. And I, I feel like we've made some strides there um, uh, with that. And, and that those, you know, the, the youth athletic associations, uh, you know, are, are you know, I, I feel like we're, we're partnering uh, a bit better with them uh, in terms of those financial uh, arrangements. So that's, I guess, a little bit of historical piece there as well. Well, I'd like to make some comments since I know this topic very well. Um, first of all, people need to understand there is no profit made by the district on this. We are losing money on it. I will go ahead and say that, Dan. Um, the increase is nothing. I mean, I've looked when I officiate and go to all these other districts, I do ask what the facility fees are. And our facility fees are nothing compared to a lot of our partnering districts. Um, our facilities are much cleaner in much better shape than other districts um, the youth programs do a good job partnering with the district um, so I I mean in all honesty I think we could ask for more but it, I'm not saying to do that <laughs> by no means but I think we're being very fair very realistic and and a five percent is nothing um, I know years ago we did talk about that budget time and now's the time frame so they can plan on it so thanks for doing that but I think that's very equitable um, I am a little surprised that we're just going at 5%, so kudos to you on that, Dan, because, again, our facilities are top-notch. I mean, our custodian groups do a phenomenal job keeping everything clean. I mean, you guys go to other fields in other communities, and you won't see them raked, chalked, lined. Um, a lot of the times you'll see cars parked on the road or on the grass and stuff, where we don't allow that here. Um, many basketball tournaments, volleyball tournaments in our school district, everything is spotless. So you guys do a great job. I think this is a great job that you guys have done on this. So thank you. Because I know when we first started with, with this about eight years ago, it was 
it was very challenging back and forth on that. So I commend you, Dan, for doing a great job on this and Cheetah and that group. Thank you, Member Carr. I appreciate your comments. Anyone else? Hannah, go ahead. I mean, Member Simmons. Can you, um, either one member who had on since that time, or Dan, could you talk about the decision not to do an incremental increase every year, year by year, and why it's going to just um, stay the 5% and stay fine the following year? Um, I, I think it was, quite honestly, it was just something that we had talked about a couple of years ago um, that, you know, it, it seems somewhat of an intermediary between going from, quite frankly, I, I, I think it was probably six, seven, maybe yeah. even eight years mm -hmm. where we had held, you know, pretty much everything flat um, and, and trying to kind of come up with a little bit of a happy medium of we're going to make some adjustments. And like I said, some, some, were, some were relatively minimal. Um, some maybe appeared outright as being quite significant and it, and it took a you know, quite a bit of dialogue with some groups to help them, you know, you know understand. I'll, I'll use uh, board member Farrell's, you know, reference to things like, uh, you know, the fields being dragged and things like that. Um, there were some, uh, you know, there were some agreements and things like that that were made with some of the youth athletic associations for them to, to, to donate, you know, and, and kind of pay for, you know, certain salaries and, and things like that. But uh, sometimes it just that stuff gets a little bit muddy and, and unfortunately it can kind of get lost in the shuffle a little bit so to have something that said you know we're going to charge you x and we think that we can you know pay our folks to do that work if we charge these rates so instead of you donating money you know to the school district we're going to charge you you know what we think you know we need to charge you to actually perform those services um you know so I don't have a great, I mean, it was kind of a happy medium of looking at, we're going to adjust these, we'll see where, they, where they are. The, the, the challenging part is it's just been such an atypical last 14 months to really, yeah. to, to be able to try to, you know, really evaluate our, our expenses and, and, and revenue generating because, I mean, we just, you know, obviously everything shut down and... It's hard, it's hard it's hard to balance because not everything is equal either in terms of you know expenditures for certain types of the year and certain you know types of functions that we um, you know we spend a lot of time you know chalking and mowing fields and, and painting fields and things like that which you know extremely time consuming versus you know having somebody come in and, and you know rent a gym space um, might be some setup and things like that that required but you know from a salary standpoint not necessarily equitable. I think the other part of that, Hannah, is the partnership between the, the programs and the school district. Um, I know that Dan or whomever could call up a youth program and say, hey, we need a little assistance with either, you know, bodies thrown at it or financial stuff, or not a lot of other groups and communities who would step up and do that. Um, Farmington is very unique to that, I will yeah. say that. So, I mean, the partnership that Dan's created across the years, across the groups for over the years has been great on that that's why i think part of it when we talked about not doing this like every year every couple of years reevaluate to see where we're at um, because my concern i mean the gym floors get used constantly by everybody all sports um and you know to resurface those are very expensive so technically we got to figure out how we can cover at least a cost on that not just with our students doing that but our other programs doing that as well so it's been working out very well from i haven't heard any any concerns over the years about and trust me i usually do you know that and it's been great is that helpful okay so what are the next steps with this is this just will this be an administrative action coming up soon is that the plan that would be the intent correct okay yeah, yeah the, the hope is yeah the, the hope was as you know board member Carell mentioned is that, you know folks are starting to get because when we we try to enact this or, or make this active starting july 1 so my hope was that you know we wouldn't have had the curfew and the meeting the last time and and uh, that we could have acted at at this point so that we can inform all those outside user groups um you know as they're doing registration and stuff like that but yes the, the intent would be to 
bring it back to the next meeting for, for an action item, correct? So I guess that's part of my question as well. So will you, are you communicating the possible increases or the in anticipated um, increases right now with those groups? Or kind um, of, kind I, of believe, I believe that uh, um, uh, the activities office has at least given them a heads up that, you know, we were planning to stick with what had been, you know, previously kind of, mm -hmm. I don't know if I want to say agreed to, but, you know, the, kind of the, the, the okay. plan from two years ago. Sounds good. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Appreciate your update. Great work. All right. Superintendent Berg, item D on the agenda, overview of strategic planning process. Yeah, I'm going to try to go through it a little bit quicker because those of you know me that this is my deal, so it could go a little bit long if I don't. So the curfew was eight, right? Yeah, <laughs> well, it's my bedtime, so it goes with that. So, um, oops, let me get this here. I'm going to actually just skip forward because I kind of put this in backwards order, and I apologize for that. So the intent tonight was to, to give, um, you know, we have a new board. Um, things have been hectic, crazy. We haven't had a chance to, to provide that opportunity. Also, in a, in a typical, you know, we keep talking about an atypical year, you know, we tend to do an update process every two years. We were supposed to do that um, this past uh, February, and clearly with everything going on, we didn't do that. Um, it should be noted that we just uh, confirmed with Dr. Cook. Uh, he's going to come back in late September. And so our plan is to kind of go through that update process then. But since we haven't done any of that, we just thought that this would be good. Um, I do think it's important when we talk about strategic planning, we talk about what it isn't first, um, because the way that we go about strategic planning is different than a lot of organizations. A lot of organizations engage in long, re long range planning, which is really this idea that I'm going to try to predict what the future is, and I'm going to go ahead and chase that, right? Now, there's some issues with that. First of all, trying to predict the future nowadays is almost impossible. And so if you project something to happen and it doesn't, can your purpose change rapidly enough to meet the new needs? And if you continue to do long range planning, the chances are that you can't do it. Also, long range planning is really based on the fact that um, external factors impact us and we really don't have any control on those. And so we're completely at the whim of outside forces. And what I think we found through our strategic planning process is that we have much more control, what we would call agency over things. We just have to look for it and ask the right questions. The other thing that a lot of organizations um, engage in is comprehensive planning, where the whole idea is the system is permanent. And to be quite honest with you, that's what our education system is engaged in for the past 156 years. We have this system. The system can't change. So we try to change within it. The problem with that is, is what we're seeing, I think, is what if the purpose changes? So this system was designed a significant number of years ago with a certain purpose in mind, really to get people ready to work in um, assembly line factories, right? We need some to be management. We're going to sort those people. We need the rest to go be workers on the assembly line and sort and separate those kids. The, our society, our economic needs, what our learners need to go find and create their own success out there is significantly different than it was back then. But the system has not changed and been able to adapt to do that. The other thing is the people within the system serve the system and instead of the system serving the people within it. Think about this, and uh, Superintendent Haugen said this a lot, right? We, we get our families, especially our kindergarten families, all in a panic because they got to be ready for kindergarten, right? They got to be ready for kindergarten. So we have families that go to um, you know, preschool screening thinking it's a legitimate test to try to get ready for it. I mean, they're preparing their kids for it. What if we simply, as a system, we were ready for the kindergartners when they came to us? The system adapted, the system changed to the needs. It's a significant you know, change in thinking and adapt adaptation process, but you can't get through that through um, comp comprehensive planning. The other thing with strategic planning is, it's really this idea of going after something extraordinary. Purpose is a huge part of strategic planning. Why do you exist? If you don't know why you exist, you can't figure out what you're going to do to support the people within your organization and the people that come to you for services. 
It's a means, not an end. It starts with an idea and ultimately has to have action in a classroom. If it doesn't end with action, it, it, it does no good. And in this process, you're either creating or you're dying, right? So we want to have that continual creation process. It gives context to all of our work. When we talk about our budget process, when we talk about reductions, when we talk about new learning opportunities, when we talk about anything within our district, we do it through our strategic lens. Does it meet our strategic purpose, right? Does it move us in our strategic direction? Does it allow us to become our identity? Does it help us meet our objectives? The answers are yes to those, we want to do them. If the, if the answer is no, we need to stop doing them. A lot of times organizations never start by asking the question, should we be doing something at all? And this helps us do that. If it doesn't meet that strategic intent, then we don't want to be spending time, energy, and money on that. And then finally, I think simply put, if it doesn't change your work, it's not strategic. It should ultimately fundamentally change what we do. So that, that's a, a real quick synopsis of what strategic planning is and isn't. Our process is, uh, we work with Dr. Bill Cook from the Cambrium Group. Um, he comes in and spends two days with our district planning team. Um, he is really big on groups of five. So your planning team either has 20 or it has 25. It doesn't have 24, it doesn't have 26, it's got 20 or 25. He's very specific about some of his processes and stuff. So the last time we went through this, we had 25 members made up of community members, staff members, and learners. The other unique thing is all decisions are made by agreement. So when they make the belief statements, when they come up with a strategy, when they determine what the purpose is, the identity is, all 25 people have to agree on it. If one person doesn't agree on it, there's not a compromise, there's not a give and take, it's out of the picture. So everything is mutually agreed upon, which is a super, super powerful thing. This group will develop the belief statements, the identity, purpose, and means, the objectives and strategies, okay? And that's over a two-day period. Your brain hurts when you're done with that process with Dr. Cook. It, he asks questions that you really don't know if you can answer, and there's dead silence until people think about it for a long period of time. It is quite the cognitive exercise, but it is super cool, and it really is interesting to see how people with all sorts of different backgrounds can get behind coming up a unifying identity, belief statements that we all agree on, that we want to exhibit in our system. It's, it's, it's super powerful. Then we hand this work over to action planning teams. Um, those planning teams are made up between eight to 12 members. Again, different members of the community, staff, and learners. So when you look at this, you're talking about 75 to 80 community members from our vast learning community have had a part in creating this strategic plan. Um, their main focus is to come up with result statements, and then I have action plans in parentheses because one of the, and we'll talk about this later, one of the things that we kind of deviate from that we learned through this process, and we've been working with Dr. Cook, uh, we found this out today, since 2006, he's been in the district. Um, and, and so we, we deviate a little bit where we don't take our specific action plans and implement each plan. They serve to be as ideas, thought starters, and things like that. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But they still go through that process and create it to help people kind of to jar their thinking around what could this look like, what action can I take. Um, talked about this a little bit, this idea of, of um, creating or dying. What happens in a lot of systems is for you mathies out there, we got a parabola, right? The top of the parabola, something has to happen. Okay, so that's kind of where that, that, that dotted line meets level one and level two. Systems and organizations get to that top of the parabola, decisions have to be made. If they don't do anything, the organization tends to die. I use the example today talking to somebody, Blockbuster, right? Blockbuster had a choice to make. They could have bought Netflix, <laughs> right? They chose not to buy Netflix, the organization died. Other organizations will do, and this is what our education system has done, they will follow the path of the dotted line at homeostasis, maintaining where they're at. And what happens, and I should have drawn this underneath that, underneath that dotted line are all sorts of scaffoldings and supports basically to keep the system alive. What have we done in education? We've added standardized testing. We've added more days to school. We've added more seat time. We've added more requirements for our teachers. We've added more standards. We've done all of these things in an effort to keep our system alive. 
The strategic thing to do is to get to that parabola, rethink what your purpose is, go through that process again, and hopefully it catapults you so you have another jump, another spin, creates new action, and you have this organic process of continually creating for us to meet the needs of our learners and our staff. And so that happens kind of on an every two-year process. We get to that point and say, do we need a new strategic plan? Do we need to be catapulted again? Or do we need to kind of continue to work because we're not quite at the top of the parabola yet. We're still working our way up. And so that process is kind of ongoing. But I do think it's interesting when you look at that graph and, 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 and put it into context that you think of some businesses around and what they're able to do and how they're able to change to meet the needs and the times and things like that. And others just stay the same, just kind of get what you got and others fall off. And we don't want to be one of those systems. We want to be one of those systems that is continually um, renewing ourselves, changing what we do, looking at things differently so that we can you know, catapult and keep our action going in our classrooms. Our belief statements, um, when we did our update in 2019, really didn't change the belief statements all that much. Um, these are statements that are true regardless of any situation. Okay, we don't look at them as strictly as an education standpoint. These should be true anywhere. Um, the, we, the group spends a significant amount of time with this because this should be the reflection of what we see in our, our community. And it's, it's pretty simple. If we believe this, then we should see this in all of our interactions. Now, we still have work to do around these, and these give us a really, really good context as we begin to formulate and think about things but it should be action through which we see and can always fall back on. Our identity, purpose, and means, and this is where kind of the, the, the real work comes in for um, the strategic planning team in terms of how are we gonna move our system through that, to that process of continued creation. The yellow highlighted, that's our identity, okay? That's what we aspire to become. So when we meet, we come up with I'll just say it's a, a crazy something looking at you can't do that. Well, that's what you want. You want your identity to be something that people say you can't do because it creates that strategic gap, something that you go after. Um, it'll be interesting to see after all we've been through over the last you know three years, if we look at this whole student-centered culture that radiates a dream of an entirely new educational world, if we feel like we've, we've gotten there and we need to be spun on a, a different thing. Um, I will say that conversations around Minnesota at the state have changed significantly around what learning can look like. Some of that is based on some of the stuff that had happened through Innovation Zones. Some of that stuff is, is based on school visits and connections that we have made. Um, you know, we talked about how the Senate has provided school districts in their bill a lot of flexibility, a lot of autonomy. Um, they've looked to our district. Um, as an example of what that can be and can what that can look like. So we'll have to take a look at this and see, do we need a new identity that spurs on that next round of creation um, and, and learning design? The blue part is um, why we exist. It's our purpose. Um, you can see it as a very strong verb, ensure. It's not weak like, well, develop and make. No, no, we, we need to make sure this happens for every student. Again, we have work to do in this area, but it's very, very strong. We did not change this very much since the last time. Uh, I think we added um, continue, continuously achieves one's highest aspirations. And then really um, the big change was responsibility to communities because each person is, is um, a part of more than one community, multiple communities. And so we need to have responsibility to all of those. And then the green part is kind of that, the, the means that becomes the what and the how um, that we're gonna, you know, how are we gonna get this done? Well, we're gonna get this done by focusing on growth, humanity, humanitarian purpose, which is service, reflection, all right, that gives meaning uh, to learning, right? We really can't learn um, if we're not willing to make mistakes. And if we make mistakes, we can't learn from that process if we don't reflect. Um, that individual empathetic agency, a big piece for us around not only the propensity to cause impact, that's what agency really is, but doing it with that vision of empathy, right? Being able to walk some, in somebody else's footsteps and then radical trust in self and others. We, we have staff in our district, um, and if we truly want our strategic plan, plan to come to life, 
we have to trust those um, within that system. And that includes our learners um, to, to be able to, to move forward in a, in a really meaningful way. This was also new guiding principles. Really, this was that idea of, hey, we do trust you, right? Here's a checklist. If you can say yes to these things, the answer is going to be yes when you bring it forward. Um, you know, I think that's a big shift in our, our organization probably, you know, in the last probably seven, eight years. We've moved from that compliance nature where we look for reasons to say no to reasons to say yes. And we can always find reasons why not to do something. It's a little bit harder to find reasons to do something. But again, our strategic plan gives us that context to say, yes, let's give it a shot. And then that reflection piece comes in. It didn't go so well. Let's talk about why it didn't go so well. What can we learn from that? How can we maybe use some of those pieces moving forward? Or is this something we want to you know, scale out and look in some different areas? Our objectives, these are what we measure. So when we look at our district scorecard, these, um, the, the dials, especially the top three dials, and then the one around um, uh, academic performance are a reflection of these three pieces in there. So again, when we are done and a student leaves our system or a learner leaves our system, these are the things that we want to see reflected in them. Now, some of it is academic. It's easily measurable on tests and things like that. A lot of this stuff is much more qualitative. And so looking at pan panorama and some different types of way to get some of that um, data that is observable in our students and, and things that they demonstrate has been a little bit of a hard, harder piece as we've gone through. But I think we, get, we have some avenues to do that, and, which is why we updated the district scorecard, especially the top two dials. We've also created a profile of lifelong learners. So those are really kind of our objectives in a much more tangible um, format that our staff can look at and say, okay, well, all learners possess capacity and resiliency to create uh, opportunities and master challenges. Well, what are some of those skills and dispositions that learners need? And then what are indicators of those? So we have those created for each of our objectives. And like I said, um, our district scorecard is really that measure of strategic um, intent within our district. And then our strategies, and I'm, I'm not going to go through because we could spend a lot of time on these, but our strategies are kind of the work we want to do, and then the result statements are the pieces that we want to go after. And this is really where we honor the agency um, of our staff to connect to these result statements and let them figure out the best way to have these come to light um, within their classroom and then with their learners. It's much, they're, they're the trained professionals. They're working with other kids on a daily basis. They know much more about that than, than us administrators do. Strategy two was the, um, the design principles strategy individual agency conducive to straight student uh, student driven learning um, strategy four this is really about our uniqueness and in indispensability um, you know how do we appreciate different cultures individual differences create bridges um, between staff and, and 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 our greater community strategy five giving knowledge to me to me this is probably the most impactful one because schools have been really good about um, giving our students information, but not really knowledge, right? How do I take information? How do I take the skills that I have and apply them in different settings? If our learners have that ability and can take that, then nothing's gonna stop them, no matter what field that they go into, but really moving from simply information to that knowledge and then how do they make meaning of that in ways that is useful um, to them. And then agency versus initiative. So our result statements serve as tangible outcomes staff can connect to based on their passion, strengths, expertise, and interests. Now, one of the reasons that we've also shifted um, this way is our staff need to feel what it's like um, to be able to connect to things based on their passion, strengths, and interests, because it's the same thing we want them to do with the learners. Right? We know learning is much more powerful. Kids are going to be much more engaged when it's connected to these things. And if we as administrators don't model that with our staff, it's never going to get down into our classrooms. The action plans serve to ignite thinking. They're the best ideas at the time. Um, some of them may drive district work, like our competency work um, across the district. Um, say, some of them may um, you know, um, drive building work or classroom action. 
And then how do we connect to that? Individuals, individ, oh, I'm sorry, administrators connect through their mutual commitments that they do on a yearly basis. Um, they're committing to um, certain work and connecting it to the strategic plan and identifying what are gonna be indicators of that. And then our staff connect to it directly through their individual IGDPs, which are their individual growth and development plans, which actually become part of teacher evaluation process in their three-year cycle. So within that, they set student learning goals, um, and those can look lots of different ways. It can be a content-specific goal, but it could also be um, some of those other skills, you know, developing a growth mindset, um, being a better reflector on your learning and things like that. And then they identify and gather data around that. And then they also set a professional development goal as well. And a lot of times staff will do that within teams or within grade levels, which, you know, um, example, or, uh, is kind of a, um, uh, a multiplier of the power and things like that. So we have really probably over the last eight years stayed away from anything district-wide that can be seen as an initiative. Um, we know that in education that initiatives have always been a part of education and some people really like them and they get super excited about it and then there's people that hate them and they become resistors and can can put really good work together the other thing is too when we look at stuff something that makes really good sense in a fifth grade classroom may not make really good sense in a ninth grade english classroom um, and so we really want to give people that opportunity to figure out how they can connect to the strategic plan and not so much worry about scaling out the what and the how, let the staff figure that out, but scale out our purpose, right? Why do we exist? And then scale out our objectives. What do we wanna see in learners when they leave that? And then let staff connect to those sorts of things. So it's a little bit different from that, but I do think um, we've seen, I mean, people come and, uh, People come and visit and they think we've moved like light years, right? And then we feel, oh, we've really kind of only moved this far in the grand scheme of the system. But I think it has helped us. The organic approach has kind of helped us to, to go slow, to go fast in some areas and stuff. So that is a, well, that's probably still longer than I should have taken, but that's, that's kind of a, a quick synopsis of kind of the general overview, how it applies in the district. Um, and stuff so and like i said we're we're due for an update a check-in to see where we're at with this um uh, part of that will be to to um, share evidence of these strategies um, with the committee um and things like that and then just do a check-in to see do we need to look at that identity or not so i'll stop talking for a second well this is dangerous because i also share a passion for teacher planning so i could just <laughs> Extrapolate a lot more, but I won't. Um, have you been part of the strategic planning process with Dr. Cook a couple of times and been able to be a fly on the wall too during some of it? It's it's amazing the process that goes behind it. As as Jason was saying, the mental Olympics you play those couple of days are exhausting, but it's amazing where he can stretch the group and where the district has been able to lead with with our strategic plan from his facilitation. So I've just always been impressed. So. And as um, Superintendent Berg said earlier, we were doing this just to try to help everyone kind of have review and kind of come on board to where we're at and kind of how our district flows and how everything works. So if you have any questions, we could probably take a couple. Yeah, one other quick thing, right? Yeah. And I think uh, Chair Saucer talked about this. I mean, for us, a strategic plan, the, the real work becomes in thinking. It's changing how we think. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of, when we talked about personalized learning, there's a lot of districts that we do personalized learning, right? We do that. Well, we do that, it, it starts to come like a checklist. We wanna, you know, we wanna be personalized learning, right? We wanna be these things, have them be part of our core. And that starts with how we think. And probably one of the biggest takeaways of this is, is we have to give people time to change how they think, which will get them to change what they think which will then get them to change behaviors and actions. And some people are quicker to that than others. And so the people that are quicker to that, we can let them go, they can do that work. And then the people that need more time, we can provide that support to them just like we did in, you know, just like our learners in a classroom. We're gonna have everybody all over the place. And if we try to get everybody at the exact same spot at the exact same time, it's a recipe for, well, we believe it's a recipe for disaster and it really stunts stuff, so. 
Is there any questions about the process or just at this point? Go ahead, Member Simmons. Outside of this meeting, but we need some additional background. I really appreciate it. Can you tell us between the two year updates, how do how we in the district and this board receive um, updates related to the implementation? I know you said that the action plans are rolled out, they're really inspired thinking. So, how does this board? Um, and the district monitor the effectiveness of our strategic plan in between the two. Yep, so that would be when we come and usually in the fall we do kind of a data update. So that would be one piece of that. And then when we update the scorecard, those would be the two biggest pieces to be able to share the board where we are in that process. And that typically happens annually? Yep, yep, yep. Same time uh, we've tried to do them typically at the same time. Um, this year was a little bit different because we suggested to the board that we change the dials. I think now that we're locked in on those dials, we'll probably do that those updates at the at the same time, mid to late fall. And as far as any of the other vendors that you talked about, I really, I really strongly believe in what you described in terms of people who are actually implementing the the change have to be believers in it. They have mm -hmm. to be driving it. They have to have strong buy-in. Um, so I think that's a really wonderful approach. How and what communication or evaluation processes are in place for the district to know how well that's working at the building or at the implementation level? Yeah, it, it, we don't we don't have a tight process with that because it, I think it's like I said I don't use the word organic. A lot of it comes through well, what questions and what support are people being asked for, right? As um, as we worked around our um, learner profile, right? So that was, again, a piece that came out of this. We had a core group that started with it. Well, then you start to get additional ask for professional development in other buildings. Competencies are the same thing, right? We can get a pretty good idea of where people are with that based on the professional development asks and things that we get, or if we have administrators coming and say, hey, we'd like to do that. So it's a much more informal process at that level, mainly because um, there's so much that goes on, quite frankly. There's, again, we, we can track the bigger things, two things that I mentioned and some other things because that's district-wide things that we have to support. But there's other things that go on at the building level to be quite frankly about we, we may not know about, so. Thanks, and one final question when you talk about the 20 or 25 member groups that help shape the strategic planning process. How are those members chosen mm -hmm. if there are community members who are listening who are wondering, is that something I can be involved in? Mm -hmm. How do I get involved in that? Can you just tell us more about Yep, so we, we typically have asked um, administrators um, to give us names of people that might be involved, you know, interested in things like that. So we'll get those names and then we'll start to just reach out to people, see, you know, they say they're interested, but then when they had, I got to miss two days of work, well, I can't do it. You know, those sorts of things and just pare it down from there. Um, we also, throughout the district, we look at, um, for a wide range of people, people we know that are invested in the work and then people we may know that may be a little questioning it because we want all of those um, people represented on that. Um, so I think if people are interested in, in saying, hey, I want to be a part of that, I think reaching out to their building administrator would be a good place to start. And um, we'll probably start to formalize that list probably mid to late summer just if, if people are interested to get that on there and stuff. So, you know, we're probably talking three to five community members would be probably the max that we have, but we also want to make sure that we're representative for some of the different, um, uh, you know, community entities that are within our, our community as well. So just try to balance all of those pieces. Yep. All right, I think we're good on that. The next item is, let's see, where is my chart? Well, the next item kind of flows into this is that we're gonna discuss how the school board committee framework works and how we function as a board. And this is kind of another piece of just kind of helping engage the board with more training from we had our in-service a couple months ago with MSPA and this is kind of a next step is just to be able to review how we work as a board from meeting to work session to committees and so this was um, created with the help of a facilitator back in April 2018. 
And some of this has changed a little bit, kind of how we've decided to the board. One thing that's different is we voted recently to have work sessions be video recorded as well. And that was one thing at the time had kind of altered in that. So that's a little bit different, just kind of snooching that nuance now. But what I'm going to, um, I'm just going to kind of review this. We have it in front of us and we, everyone's had time to prepare. But at the time when we, when we changed this look at things, we had lots of board members on various committees. And sometimes the committees were just, they were just kind of there, you know, I mean, they were nice to be there, but it wasn't really served as a purpose. And so in order to create more of a purpose for the board and be doing actual doing board work as committees before the board meetings, we created the committees for the, the school board. And at that time we created the executive committee, making of the chair, the vice chair and the superintendent. And then we, the policy committee, the Finance and Long Range Planning Committee, and then the Public Engagement and Legislative Agenda Committee. Well, those were the ones that we felt as a board were important to keep as board committees to do, and to let the, those committees work together and kind of do what we call like pre-work, things that can be done before the board or within a committee. And most of these committees also, actually I think all of the committees, not only have board members, but they also serve with administrative counterparts as well that represent those areas. For example, um, like the Finance and Long Range Planning Committee that has our finance director on it as well as our facilities director together so that they can plan and work in tandem with desires of the board but also be appraised of what's coming up in the future for finance. Same kind of thing with policies. You have a couple members of the board as well as the administrative staff that works with policy. They work together in tandem and then that comes back for the board. So it's creating, it's doing board work, kind of that behind the scenes, almost homework so to speak, before we get to the board table. And so Kind of, now that's kind of how the process works. Now I'm going to look at, when we look at step three on this chart, I'm going to kind of go backwards with it to kind of talk about where we're at now. So like right now, for example, we're in, we're in a formal board meeting, as we would call it. Though lately our board meetings don't seem much different than the format that we're doing that because of the spacing. But traditionally with our, for, with our formal board meeting, we'd board be, you know, in a, more of a the L-shaped format, you know, a straight board, kind of like the city council chamber is how we worked. And it's a lot more formal. The actions in the board meetings are, in, are intended to be a little bit shorter because the information has been re reviewed previously at a work session and it, it's going back and forth. And so that at the board meeting is kind of what we're doing right now. So if we go back in the process to the work sessions, the work sessions are more supposed to be more, a little more of a collaborative format. Not that our business meetings aren't collaborative, but to have that more a little bit laid back format more of the circular format to be able to have discussions more in depth more of a deep dive into the issues at hand and allow the board to have as much in-depth discussion as they want so that when we do bring it back to the formal board meeting we're pretty much on the same page we can definitely ask questions about things that happen in the rows but it allows to let the, the formal board meeting be a little just more streamlined to be able to keep with the flow of meetings and, and then, so that's just kind of the format between the board meetings, but then to flow how the committees work into that whole process, as I mentioned before, is the committees have that pre-work or that homework and they're individually, and then they bring, they can bring those back to a board meeting or a work session to discuss with the board kind of what they've been working on. And just kind of FYI, if you are on a committee, at any point in time, if you feel like you have an update to the board, letting the chair know about it so we can get on the agenda is highly appropriate because we want to be able to go back and forth with what you're working on. And so what happens though is that, um, but there's also a give and take between the work session and the board meetings and basically the entity of the board and the committees. So when the committees come back and brief the board about what they're doing and going on, it's kind of a check and balances. So there's, all, there's kind of a fine range of parameters of what the committee can do on their own because the committee is operating as a portion of the board without the entire board present, but needs to have kind of the okay and approval of the board. So one thing we talked about, I know during that training was kind of a red light, green light. You know, you, the committee can go back to the board and say, hey, this is something we'd like to do. I think this is within our parameters. This fits what we're working on as the definitions of our committee. And then it's kind of for the board to say, yep, that sounds great, go ahead. Or the board can say, eh, I'm not sure about that, let's discuss a little bit more, let's tweak it, maybe we want to change that. Um, and then also the process of, you know, the, the whole board could say, eh, nope, that's, we don't want to be working on that. And kind of the give and take and back and forth. So that's kind of how, not kind of, that's how the process is intended to work. And just wanted to kind of review that process with you. Um, that's kind of my best kind of quick 
summary, if Superintendent Berg has anything else that you wanted to add, or even if Je um, Member Doyle as vice chair, or in fact, any members of the board as well, have any comments about how historically it's worked? I mean, it's still fairly new for us, even though it's been a few years, we're still kind of tweaking and working on how the process works as a board. So I kind of open up to whoever would like to comment or add, or just, just at this point, it's about the process. Yeah, I think, you know, when you start back from the business meeting to the work session to the committee, that business meeting is about action, right? The board is going to take action on something. We try to bring it to, um, to a work session maybe once or twice to get feedback, have conversations, and the committee would meet maybe before a work session to try to get some feedback on what we might be bringing to a work session. But I think the, uh, my impression of this is the ultimate goal is, is that as we work through this process, there should be the intent to have some board action at the end of it. So whether for the finance committee, it's approving uh, the budget or approving, taking something out to bid or using some bond dollars or, you know, the policy committee making a change to policy or something like that, or, you know, if the legislative and, and community engagement wants to have the board make a statement about something or wants to um, have some, you know, create a legislative platform or something like that. Those, that, that's my understanding of the intent in working backwards, but I yeah. wasn't a part of all of these when they were formulated either. When was it? That was a good team effort. You filled in a few blanks that I missed on that action piece. Yeah. I appreciate that. Member Doyle, did you have anything that you'd like to add being having part of the process on the committee? Okay. Mm -hmm. it, Lori, is this our school board booklet, this document by chance, for incoming school board members? It is okay. Because I know, I, I mean, maybe that's something I, I would say, whoever's the chair at the time, is to go over that with, with new members coming in, because it is very confusing yeah. just mm -hmm. reading it and not living it. You're like, what's the difference with governance and, and these meetings and stuff? So, yeah. Yeah. No, that's it's a good document. Good yeah, absolutely. And it's still, if, if living and breathing, we're adjusting it yep. as we go. And as I said, it's still a little bit new to all of us to an extent as well. Yeah, as an incoming board member, this is something that I, I think would be helpful going back to a discussion that we had at a previous meeting around the benefit of documenting, using a document like a charter or whatever you want to call it to say, what is the purpose of this board? Is it a standing committee? Is it a short-term ad hoc committee? For example, if it's something that, it's, that the board commissions um, as a task force, this is a board that this is a committee that's going to meet for six months and six months only while we collect within the scope very specific information around boundaries, for example. So I think it would help to have that type of documentation to support our, our these standing committees. Um, and the other thing that I think would help us uh, is when we are doing board assignments in the circumstances that there are new board members like this year, I think as much as possible where it makes sense, it would be great to pair an experienced board member with a new board member. I know that for, um, I, I won't speak for Kyle, but for our committee that, we'll, that I'll give an update on, having two new board members um, for a relatively um, broad or vague, mm -hmm. the purpose is a little vague for our committee, um, that does make it challenging, not having somebody kind of working alongside you who has that history, who can help guide that. So those would be two recommendations, just as a new board member being in my fourth month of how we can improve that process in, um, in real time as well as you know, any time that we have a changeover in, in uh, membership. Well, about that, to be well, with you. No, and I believe we kind of discussed that a little bit during the process. Like, do you guys both? And that was a little bit of discussion, yeah. but it wasn't like a, it wasn't. I don't think this dis discussed at length. So yeah, I know I appreciate that, and that's that's typically done in some boards I've been on. So I appreciate that feedback. In terms of the um, like parameters or the charter of the committees, do we, ha Mr. Um, Superintendent Berg, do we have something like that for some of them? Because I thought we did, well, or we maybe it was just inherited no, I mean, from this. I, I think to Hannah's point, I think the, and we've talked about this kind of informally, the legislative and public engagement one is, uh, and I've been on it, it, yeah. it is it is very broad, and um, I, I think 
when you look at like the finance committee, very clear yeah. Yeah. role. Policy committee, very clear role. You know, I think the executive committee, I think the engagement and the legislative one is is much more gray. I, you know, yeah. so I, 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 no, we don't have anything like that. And, and it's not intended to be something complicated less than yeah. The executive mm -hmm. committee consists of the chair, the vice chair, and the superintendent. Yep. Their role is to meet twice a month before the board meeting, meeting set the agenda, pull it, pull it, pull it. And, and I have to say, we did, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I think we did create something like that around the time, but I think it was more, and I, I think it was more just communication that the chair sent out kind of as we were forming. I don't know if we brought anything formally down, but in terms of, I don't think it wouldn't, I don't think it would hurt for the public engagement and the legislative committee to sit down and kind of create a little bit of those parameters and then, you know, maybe bring them back to the board. You know, another idea is maybe, maybe it's time, maybe there's just time for the board to consider if we want, and I, I'm just throwing this out there, not saying I'm supporting it, but if maybe we consider it, we, do we want to keep that committee? Do we want to, you know, once you kind of talk about those parameters, maybe it's something we want to split off or maybe we want to rethink how we look at it. And it's interesting, re having reviewed the strategic plan just now made me think we might need to just rethink how we're looking at things. But I'm not saying it's time to throw it away. It just we might want to look at how we rethink it as a board and just give it some time, since it has been the one that's been the most ambiguous to an extent. Well, and Chair Sosser, just yeah. on this current agenda item, because we will be talking about that committee specifically yes. on the next agenda mm -hmm. item, I think it's important for consistency and transparency to follow the same process. Again, if it's a simpler discussion for those policy committee or the executive committee, that's great. But mm -hmm. we should be doing things uniformly so that we can communicate that to the public, to our district administration partners, what our expectations are, so that um, it's the same experience regardless of what committee you're on. Can you, extract, can you expand on that a little bit more about what you mean by the same in terms of reports to the board, in terms of just kind of expand where you're thinking? No, I, I mean simply if one committee is going to document who's on it, what their purpose is, and for how long they meet, then we should do that for all committees oh. that are standing. No, for that's fair. That we okay. Is there any Anything else to add or any other questions or from any other board members that have served a little bit more time on the board with this process? All right, I think we're good. All right, let me see the next agenda item here. I think it's me as well. Okay, it, so this the next item, item G, is the compensation for school board members oh. on district. Oh, Did I? Oh, I'm sorry. You mentioned I thought we did committees and my brain just went, my apologies. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. <laughs> Okay. All right, so F, public engagement and legislative committee update. So go ahead and just to note to the public, um, member Christensen had, was under the weather, not able to attend tonight. So that's why he is not here. So he led to Hannah, member Simmons, take everything. So wish you the best. <laughs> Good. So this is a timely discussion for this committee that we um, are able to provide to the board. So we have met two times. Our last meeting was at the beginning of March. And so as this committee has come together to try and figure out what are, what are our goals, how are we supporting the strategic plan, what really is within our scope or our benefit to the board work that's being done. There's a key piece that we zeroed in on, and I apologize, I would have loved to have shared or sent us because I'm a visual person and I like to read, so I'll read it to you um, and know that it's available. One of the standards that uh, is shared through the MSBA Standards for School Board Leadership is Standard 5 Advocacy and Communication, which reads, the school board advances its vision at the local, regional, state, and national levels. An effective, high-performing school board strives to meet the following benchmarks. A, focus on community-wide concerns and values that best support equity and student achievement rather than being influenced by social interests. B, develop communication strategies to build trust between the school board and the superintendent, staff, students, and community. C, utilize a public relations strategy that supports the flow of information into and out of the school district. D, engage and build relationships with both public and private stakeholders. E, advocate on local, state, and national levels. There is also under standard two a provision, which I will not read this entire one, but under that standard item E says communicate the strategic plan and the progress to the community. 
So within this, the, these items of these two standards, one of the things that we as a committee would like to share with the board um, is that in the times that we've met, we have really gotten oriented to some of the work that this committee has done and the potential work ahead. Uh, knowing that we have a strategic planning update coming in September, and the next steps that we'd like to take are to identify that communications and public engagement, the work of this committee, is an important component of our strategic planning work. A newly constituted board is an opportunity to level set our current efforts and our results. And we'd like the board to commission an inventory of our current internal and external communication programs that align with this strategic plan, including our tactics and processes, our results, plan versus obtained, and complete gap analysis, what's working, opportunities for efficiency, and unmet needs that we could bring forth to a working session uh, in the year of June. So I'll pause there and see what questions the board has. Um, again, this is really to try and narrow in our scope and the focus because it's so broad, aligning with the standards that are set forth for an effective school board while benefiting our upcoming strategic planning uh, update that we have planned for fall. Member Simmons, can you go, can you just reiterate what you were just asking and kind of maybe give um, maybe a little more tangible example of kind of what you're asking for? I mean, I understand the language that you're using and Kyle actually CC'd me with that email so I know what you were reading, but for anyone else to be able to hear that as well as for me, I, I can see the broad perspective, but I almost need like a specific example if you have something that would tie in to give us more example of kind of what you're asking for. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that we identified is the challenge with working backwards is predicting that you know the solution, which we just talked about with our strategic planning processes. Within this group, we can't say that the solution will be action on a recommendation for developing a position at the administrative level to support communications. And we can't say that the action might be um, you know, development of a committee focused on um, focus groups or supporting a, an in and out flow. So we don't know what the answer is because we don't know what the needs are. So what we're asking for at this point with our next steps is to just take an inventory of what we're currently doing. So what currently uh, do we have in terms of partnerships as identified in the standards? So those PTPs that exist. Uh, other partnerships that we have talked about as a board um, and really just mapping those out so infrastructure to support uh, those types of things might be the newsletters that each building are sending out um, and uh, other types of surveys things ways that we're collecting information from the community so it's really trying to answer that question around building relationships communicating the strategic plan how are we currently getting information in from the community and in what ways are we currently sharing it as a as a board and as a district so all we're asking for at this point is to map out what's currently happening so i, I guess i have a question is that yeah. been, my assumption is that we've that was kind of shared with the committee kind of a, a fairly large list of things that were going on in terms of communication or is that committee looking for something else um from our administrators in terms of what exactly are is are we going to take an inventory of because when I hear newsletters when I hear specific things that could be very significant in terms of the workload that our administrators need to put together so we just need to figure out if we can do that in a timely fashion or not if that's actually what the board is looking for or what what we're asking for so can you what it, what are we looking for? Yeah, that's a great question, Jason. So what was shared with uh, Kyle and I on the committee were uh, pieces of the action plans that were created tied to the results statements, but they weren't detailed or specific. So yep. And we don't have that. So we're not going to be able to share result or action statements with or the action plans because as discussed, we don't we don't track that part of things. But it, what I heard you ask and, and, and asked about was um, newsletters, those things that the district does to communicate. Um, I, I thought we put something, did we not? Was there not something put together that was shared along that with the committee? There wasn't? No, we have a meeting tomorrow and that was part of why we were okay. discussing with the board what opportunities we have to simplify that because it was a pretty long list 
of opportunities, res results, and we just really want to zero in on not everything that's being done, just the key components that are supporting that flow of information in and out, specifically around the board and district work and strategic planning achievements. Does that help? I think it's the second part of that because we you're exactly right in that we don't know what we don't know and again identifying what data sources we're getting I think right now we all have experiences with people sharing feedback with us in a, anecdotally right so is that enough to su make a suggestion as to a change of a way that we are doing something as a board probably not so how how can this committee support a more objective <clears throat> review of the way that we are doing that so that we have identified needs and if there are changes proposed we can support and justify that in a way that's meaningful does that help and we'll and the board will get just so the committee knows the board will get information on that based on the community survey so you you bring up a great point right because we all get information mm -hmm. from different groups and is it you know what is the impact and how do people feel like they're being communicated to so that's one of the reasons that we do that scientific piece is trying to get some stuff that's that's much more based so that will be part of it as well and it might be worth looking at the um, previous data too so right. which was shared in Friday notes so we can take a look at that I mean if that might help the committee's work too if we're talking about just communication from the board at the district level, I don't know if we necessarily need to evaluate the way that individual schools are sending out information. Because then I feel like we're kind of stepping outside of our role to put the administrative job to do that for information regarding each school specifically because those aren't decisions that we make. Mm -hmm. So maybe that would take a lot less of a load on the administrative as far as if we're creating that document, but that's just my thought. But I think we could utilize those because I, I, I'm lucky. Lori has signed me up over the years. I get all the emails from the principals, so it's kind of nice to see what's going on in each building. So, and again, when something comes up, I usually notice there's a common theme that if, if Jason sends something out um, or a survey, for example, that you know Meg from you know Bachman's going to send it out, and then Grings will send it out from her, and, and then I'll see it and say, okay, now at least I know it's going to all this. All the all the schools out there. Right. Is, is that kind of what you're? Yes, and I think okay. to your point, Jacqueline, you're exactly right. I don't I don't think either of us are suggesting or want to dig into what each building's doing. But as a new board member coming in, maybe you guys have been doing this so long, you know off the top of your head, and you can easily say. And, and if so, if there's a board strategy or something that you have formed as a board that you want to share with us or that you think this committee could be doing, we're open to that. Um, but I would say as a new board member coming in, if a community member asks me, how, how are you as a board communicating what you're doing, what your strategic plan is, I would, I would say, well, we have our board meetings live streamed and I would know what I'm a part of, but I couldn't give all of this great information and work that is going on behind the scenes. I couldn't say, oh yeah, we, we do a survey once every two years with the community. We survey the teachers every year to inform our strategic plan. We, you know, to be able to, again, be informed about what that work is and communicate that so that we're demonstrating our role from an accountability standpoint that we do understand what's going on, I think is an important piece. And, and again, there's no action um, proposed as far as what we might do. And if you have suggestions, again about your needs or what you think this committee could be doing please share because you all have been on the board for a long time and given the timing around the legislative piece with session being over pretty soon that's that's not an area where it seems to make a lot of uh sense to invest more time and energy until next year so, so a couple of things i was something i was thinking of one i like what i remember Kerr mentioned about um any board member is able to connect with Lori to be able, if you want to get on the listservs for all the different buildings. I know for me, it was like, I have a hard enough time reading the two or three that I get. I didn't want five more, <laughs> but that is something that is available. If you're, I think if you're asking for um, kind of just like when information is sent out, 
I don't, would that be that hard of an ask of like, there's weekly newsletters from each building, there's, you know, principal updates, just kind of that, just general of when things are sent out and then well, maybe. I'm, yeah, I'm and, not trying to say we can't provide. Oh, no, no, I'm just trying to. know what information. Yeah. No, I'm just trying to understand yep. like what they're asking for and kind of the depth because my thought is if, you know, just a summary, like every building sends out newsletters and maybe the catalyst to sending out a district update or kind of these parameters or this one we've sent out stuff in the past, something like that. Um, is that kind of what you're looking for, just kind of what we're currently doing, just to have more of a, be more abreast of the issues and how the district communicates also maybe tying in how that community survey works, kind of that kind of a piece, just more of an informational of kind of what you're doing. I think, honestly, I think using the word audit sounds a little, whoa, you know, <laughs> just, just, I mean, I understand what you're asking for and I understand why you use that language, but I think that sounds like a lot to ask to an extent, so just lingua. Linguistics change a lot of your expression, you know, of what you use, so. I think another part of it is maybe we owe you where we get our information. Mm -hmm. Because I'm sure none of us are on the same page. You, we all probably go to different resources um, and, and maybe compile that. I mean, I would, I would like that to know, because maybe I could narrow that down. Because unless, to me, I mean, Lori's the greatest resource in the world, but I hate to bug her all the time. And after four years, you know, I've learned, well, now I know where to go look for certain things. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, that would be one suggestion. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good one, too. Well, and the other thing that's a benefit to this, and I appreciate Lisa Edwards joining me, is the MSBA training representing your community through policy and engagement, mm -hmm. or is the training that both she and I are going through right now. So, again, trying to learn while, while we have this ability of really passionate people within this committee to try and hear from our administrative partners understand what, again, just what sources of information we're using to inform our policy and engagement work, especially as it relates to advocacy, legislative pieces in our community, um, I think is really going to help us get over the hump. Because right now, the challenge of circling and trying to figure out what are we doing, where do we zero in on, at least this gives us a starting point to, mm -hmm. so that we're all on the same page of what were you, you know, what exists and then being able to have that dialogue with each other and bring that back to the board. Because even from our student school board members, I've learned a lot tonight of mm -hmm. other stuff that went on where I'm like, oh my God, I, I missed yeah. that. I'd love to send notes out to people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, because I have that written down. <laughs> where did you guys get that information? Yeah. Um, but well, I think it's a good idea. I understand what you're trying to do now on that. Okay. No, I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a heavy ask. I think I under, by being able to talk it through, I think it makes sense. I don't remember Coletta, you've been a little quiet over here. Do you have any thoughts about what they're asking? Do you have, what are your thoughts? I don't, I think you explained your needs very well, um, Hannah, and um, you know, I think you know what we can do to support and clarify that, that function for the committee. I personally have not been on that committee, so um, I wouldn't mind learning more through this process with you as well. So absolutely, I think um, I think we need to clarify some things if it's in that broad of a gray area for you and for Kyle, absolutely. And I, I can't remember, and the discussions are kind of meshing in my head, but the, I think, I don't know if it was in the last, last item or this item, how you talked about kind of creating that chart or your parameters as well, I think would be useful. And um, something else, I just lost my name. Oh, the other part of the committee, that legislative piece, and maybe we consider separating them. I don't know, maybe it's a heavy ask, it's something to add. It just, um, I know when I served on the committee, we always tried to kind of look and see what our member, our, our different members that we work with, with the legislative issues, whether it was AMSD, whether it was MSBA, whether it was, um, there's a few other ones that we work with that create legislative platforms and the kind of piece was to see if there was any priorities that aligned specifically what we were doing as a district mm -hmm. and allowed the committee access and also coming back to the board if there was just something like a um, legislative resolution that would be support something we're doing. And I know that's something that I know like Superintendent Berg's called upon to testify quite often on things that do match our goals at our strategic plan and just kind of having kind of that two way back and forth and just kind of narrowing on if there was something specific to our district that is a, a legislative priority to be able to have that experience and be able to kind of work with that lobbying process or however the board like to go about it through you know checking with the board with how we'd like to proceed with that and honestly like we are at the end of session and just hearing the updates from jane today seeing those there are a couple of things that might be worth discussing i don't know what your agenda is tomorrow 
but being the last few weeks of session, um, that might not be a bad focus to look at, even though I know it doesn't sound like you spent a lot of time on that, and I understand you've got a lot on your plate, but it might be something to just consider if there was something in those three plans between the governor and the House and the Senate. If there was something that we'd like to hone in on to hopefully get out of the, um, the committee when they meet all together, the name's not hitting me, when they correlate together to kind of figure out what that process is, that would be a, would be a good time. So just something to think about, because right now it's kind of the prime time as things are finalizing there. So just on that other aspect. So kind of my two thoughts there. I think we have quite a few ideas, either that, that the communication, like how it gets to everybody, I like that. Um, you know, sharing what the, each committee meant. We talked about that in the last part, as well as you know, where do we all get information? How do we know what's going on? And that, I think that's very useful. It would be very useful to somehow put that together. I'm not sure how that will look and what that would be, but I like that idea. So kind of summarize there, is that helpful? Do you feel like you have a place to go? And I think, I think the board's in favor of this, what you're asking at this point. If I can read everyone, okay, for that. I think if we over some as a board, you know, I would give us a time frame. I mean, it's a quick email to send her. Sure, how about, um, what about this? What if everyone, sends an email to me in the next week about kind of where you finding your information okay. from. And it can be as, I mean, what were your, if, if member Carr, if you could kind of just give kind of summary of kind of what you were thinking about, like well, I mean, you I'm, get it from X, Y, yeah, and Z, like exactly. what would you say? Just this that simple, I get it. I'm signed up for all the emails from all the schools. Okay. I get the newsletter and stuff like that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so how about, um, you know what I'll do? I will make a note in the call for items to have everyone ask to kind of answer that question and then within our call for items time frame, get that back and then I can honestly just share that with the whole board when we get the update. Does that work? Thanks, that would be helpful, I appreciate that. And to your point, Melissa, that you talked about with the legislative or the public engagement piece, I think that's very valid. That again goes to what recommendations might we bring to the board and not, not being able to have the dialogue around what the needs are. It could be that this doesn't make sense to have together. Maybe the legislative committee is the one that's standing and every year their purpose is to adopt a platform and maybe the public engagement committee is an ad hoc committee that each year sets two goals related to what the board wants to do or communicate that year with the mm -hmm. public i mean it, again i we don't know what that might be but i think that's valid and without knowing where we're starting from i think that uh it would be difficult to to have a meaningful discussion or bring any any recommendations to the board for discussion at a work session without just mm -hmm. having a shared understanding of where we're starting from. No. And and finally the last piece that I think was kind of key around understanding that infrastructure and our sources of information is one of the questions that I received most often and you heard me ask it of uh, Superintendent Berg was how are committees formed because there were a lot of people who wondered I'm interested in racial equity. How do I get involved in the school in this? What are our processes for selecting people? So again, understanding that for, for the committees that do exist, what that process looks like so that we can say objectively, um, you know, as a board member, this is how people are selected. You should call your building administrator if you're mm -hmm. interested in this work, um, you know, is a really important transparency piece, I think, for people to know that the same people aren't ending up on all the same committees so that, you know, we have, say 20 committees and it's the same 20 people on all of them. I think that's really a, a key component of understanding some of that infrastructure that exists and how that information is curated and developed. Oh, I appreciate that. That's a great idea to make note um, to do something like that because that would definitely be how to engage the community and how we can get involved and it could, it could be, you know, your committee work, but it could be a simple like website or link to page somewhere. Right. So, all right. I think if we're are we okay with that we're in an end point right now and we'll go forward and as i said before as always if you're on a committee that you have want to come back to the board let us know i said you you would say more you uh, excuse me talking too much you were saying thinking about coming back in may june let us know and as always we can get on the agenda whenever it works thanks yep all right now to not skip on the agenda let me go back so many screens open all right the next topic is item G, compensation for school board members on district negotiations team. So um, there's a couple attachments here and I want to give credit to our administrative secretary, Lori Johnson, for putting those documents together. She went through the history of school board stipend, salary, committee payments, what has gone on in the last, I think it was almost 15 years, it was a very in-depth, detailed to kind of see where the board has come from and has kind of where the movement has gone. 
as you, I'm not going to go into specific details, anyone can look at the list, but we went from having um, specific stipends for chair and board members with, you know, additionally X amount per hour of a board meeting, X amount per hour committee, extra over a certain hour, some of these specifics. And then the board kind of ebb and flowed, and if they wanted to not have that and have that, and the history is there. Currently, right now, we just have the board and the chair and vice chair have make a little bit more than the rest of the board, and we had went away from having any stipends for committee appointments. In the discussion this year, there was discussion from there was interest from members of the board to have a more involved process in the district negotiation process and to be able to be at the table. And this is something from the discussions we've had is we've had, it's ebb and flowed as well. We've had board members on the committee, we've had them not in the committee, and previously when they were on the committee, there were stipends involved with that piece, and there is, was some discussion from board members to consider having a stipend associated with being on the negoti negotiations committee, being that it is a heavy lift committee and there's a lot more work involved with that. There have been questions from board members that have asked whether um, administrative members make any extra salary for being on that committee. There's been questions whether um, union members make anything extra and that information, as far as we know, it has been distributed to the board to understand how that piece works. And so that's kind of the history of where we're at and where we're at today. And I just would like to turn over to board members if they have any thoughts. We, the current discussion the current makeup of the negotiations committee with board members is with member Doyle and member Carrero. And they've had a handful of meetings so far, and I know they've all, board members have also asked approximately how many meetings negotiations has, and that estimates has also been sent to the board depending on the year, so the board's aware of those details. I'm trying to think of anything else to add before we open discussion. I think that's kind of a summary of where we're at to this point, and I'd just like to open the floor to Board members on their thoughts of one, the salary stipend piece with committees and kind of where your thoughts are at this point in time and whether you'd be interested in entertaining a stipend, to the salary, a stipend for the negotiations committee and if so, kind of what that would look like. So whole lot, lots of questions there, lots of background. So I'll turn it over to whomever would like to start. I guess my suggestion is since I'm on the committee. Go ahead, Member Crow. If there was a stipend to be portrayed I would not say it would have, I would say it would be a flat rate, so you know who's on it, so there's no logistics on the backside for Lori to do anything if it's, because I saw there was like $30 for meetings. I, I, I think it managerial wise it would be easier just to say, here's an easy X amount of dollars instead mm -hmm. of, you know, because I was reading these and I, and I don't know what the right answer is. No, and Member Pryor, I appreciate you mentioned that. That was one thing I didn't kind of gloss over in the history. One, one reason why the board moved to have to go move away from stipends from each individual meeting <laughs> was the accounting process of it was, on, it was on the board member to report to Lori and to kind of keep that. And it was kind of just a lot of extra little, you know, nickel and diming of things to keep track of the cost and piece, which was a, was hard. And I think it was some board members report, some board members wouldn't. And I know Lori would have to track people down and say, did you go to this meeting? And that was one of the thoughts, because I believe originally at the time when the board increased the salaries a little bit, they took away that stipend process just for convenience, because that's a lot of work. Lori does a lot of things. We appreciate what she does for her, but tracking down if we attended her meeting or not, I don't yep. think is her responsibility. I think that's ours. <laughs> so, I, Chair, Chair yeah, Sosser, absolutely. I have a question for either Jacqueline or, or Steve. Um, first of all, I do agree with just a flat charge because I think it would be easier for everybody. But also I'm curious because I know that it was a big commitment for you guys with work and whatnot. I know you guys both work obviously outside the board. Did it affect your work schedules? Did you need to take any time off? And approximately how much time? We currently are in the afternoon, so just kind of extension of the work day to accommodate teachers. Okay. But I know in the past on negotiation cycles, there have been days where it's all day long. So it just kind of depends on that negotiation cycle. But up to this point, it's an extension of the work day. But, okay, but not limited to a full day that would have you know, cause you to... As of yet, well, no. 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 But in the past, <laughs> absolutely. But, okay, so... Hopefully not. I mean, it's one of those, it's a wild card. The goal is to be done with it. Mm -hmm. You know, 
that's the goal. That's the end game. But since I've been on it, it it's very timely. Personally, I'd like to thank both of you because I know I wasn't able to do it. And so I appreciate the two of you being able to and representing the negotiations on behalf of the board. I, I fully support a stipend or, or reimbursement for time because I know it is a very big time commitment. Member Simmons, does it look like it. Simmons, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Looks like you had something to say. Yeah, I appreciate Re uh, Rebecca's comments. I agree. I think that um, when we were first talking about the need for having board members join the committee, uh, the negotiations committee, one of the things that we agreed as a board was that we wanted to be present to be um, a, an, an actual part of this and this is important. So I think if it's something that we said was a priority and that you two kindly agreed to before there was a stipend, which I, I appreciate, um, I do think it's important to support priorities with resources as well, given the time commitment that you both are doing. So mm -hmm. um, I agree it should be a flat uh, rate and I appreciate the work that Lori put into um, Lori and Marianne to estimate the number of hours over the past ne uh, few negotiation cycles of that time spent um, in actual meetings and that didn't even, it was on average 25 hours additionally and that did not include the planning or prep time she noted that was on average in the negotiations meetings and so expecting a, around a 25 hour mm -hmm. average minimum I think, um, again, I appreciate your, your willingness to do that and to represent the board there. And I'm wondering, can we do, you know, can we think about maybe, you know, because each negotiation is going to be different. Um, could we maybe do like one to 10 hours or one to 15 hours, the flat rate is this, and then 16 to 30 hours is this, or do something like that, because the more hours you invest in it, I feel the more reimbursement because the more it's affecting your full-time jobs maybe needing to adjust hours there or whatnot um i wonder if maybe we should look at something on that level of you know certain hours and just but have it a straight okay. and i theme. i appreciate that thought process on that i just think it would be a logistic nightmare i i yeah. i think and again, just from other negotiations of just sitting when, you know, Jane and Marianne represented us at the meetings and them coming back and then other stuff going on. I, I mean, we know where we're getting, we know what we signed up for. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's going to take time. Um, so I, regardless if it's 10 hours or 200 hours, me personally, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't say I want more money. I didn't do this for the money, but it, not discouraging what you're saying. I get what you're saying, and yeah. I appreciate that. No, absolutely. But that's just that's just me on that. Member Doyle, what no, are your I, thoughts? I kind of agree with you. Just when I mean, we were talking previously about the stipends, and it was kind of a nightmare for the mm -hmm. board for people to keep track and turn their hours. So you're getting right back to that where you have to kind yeah. of keep track. And then what happens if it's scheduled for two hours or so many hours, forty minutes, or if it's two hours and fifteen minutes? Like how do you? Mm -hmm kind of balance that stuff out. together so like but like Steve said it's we're doing it regardless so it really isn't a huge factor to me if, it, if we're gonna I don't need to break it down hourly yeah I, so I guess your question is you're looking for a number I'm I have no idea oh. what a number but I'll throw something out <laughs> just looking because if I did if you did it based on hours like originally I, there I mean it'd be astronomical I think oh I agree I'm, yeah. I'm saying like two or three hundred dollars is more than I would say is adequate. I don't want to speak for anybody else. I, I, I mean, I, I just curious is that based on a percentage or anything, or just kind of throwing out there? Just kind of I'm curious where you got to that number. If you've had any thought, or are you just throwing it out well, right I'm now? Well, I'm just throwing out because just looking at you know twenty five dollars per hour beyond blah blah blah. If you did the math on that, mm -hmm. you're you're talking yeah quite a bit of money, and I don't think that's mm -hmm. I didn't sign up for. I'm I'm, I'm not here to make money. Okay. Fair. Well, no one here, I think, is here to right. <laughs> but, I mean, I don't We're here to save the district money. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I didn't that. mean to say it that way. Um, yeah. Because I think you need to have a flat rate going into it. This is what it is. This is what you're signing up for. And if it's two hours or 400 hours, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's my take. So. 
looking for thoughts. Yeah, I appreciated Rebecca's comments because I think that um, that idea that Rebecca had was really trying to balance fiscal responsibility, right, yep. with um, yep. with compensation based on something other than a random number. And so I really appreciate that. Uh, that's what I struggled with too, mm -hmm. with the um, history and the comparisons to others. Is that it? It, it is difficult to find a, a starting point that feels reasonable um, and, and that's founded in something that's not a number in thin air. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, um, I, I also agree with Steve though that I think um, two to three hundred dollars, given what we know of the estimated time commitment, minimum time commitment of 25 hours on average over the last few cycles. Um, if you are looking at that from an hourly perspective, that comes out to just just barely above minimum wage. And so that I, I feel like that is something that feels reasonable given the work that we are asking our, our, our peers on the board to do. And so I would support that. What about you, Member Doyle? I'm fine. I, honestly, I don't really want to speak to it because I'm getting it. That affects you. It's no, no, I hear I really it. That's hard. To, no, whatever that's everyone wants to do, I'm fine with. No, and I, I do appreciate your comments, Rebecca, regarding just the time piece because, I mean, I do see the point of it, like what Hannah was saying. Like, I understand that piece. Like, if there'd be a way to incentivize, you know, less time, I'd almost like to do it that way, you know, but then keeping track of the numbers and right. it's not just the, the length of time isn't just there are multiple parties involved, so we can't dictate how many meetings and how many hours it's going to be because it's, it's a collaborative process. So um, I think a straight number is a great idea. And right now, this is just um, this is just reports and communications. We're just discussing it. So we'd have to bring it back to a full board meeting, which would probably be in a month to kind of figure out that process. So there is time to kind of narrow in on that number. Um, I am in favor of supporting the negotiations team for the extra time that they're doing. I like the idea of a flat rate. Um, my suggestion right now is that we kind of I would just, we table it the discussion the amount until that following maybe we can discuss it more a little more at the next work session just maybe we can narrow on, on that number I'd like to have the entire board here and I do agree with Member Doyle and Member Carrero that since they're on on it that we throw out that number that's a lot to ask and it's looking like they're just asking for for more, more compensation for a committee they volunteered to be on so that that right. that can be tough and I don't I don't want that perception either so. Let's table it and come back with like narrowing that number down at the next work session and then we would go to vote for it at the following meeting. Is that fair, giving us time, a little more time to think about it, knowing mm -hmm. that the board's in favor of having a flat compensation, not tied to hours, and maybe we can formulate a little more rationale to like specific number and why. Because I'd like to see a little more rationale to it because at the same, the optics of this as well, in terms of going in negotiations, this is very public, the committee is going to know, the union's going to know, everyone's going to know about it, and I think anything that we choose could have an effect in the negotiation process as well. So we need to be very mindful of that mm -hmm. as well. So is that all right for now? We can kind of hold it? We're yeah. in favor of that, yes. Okay, we're in favor of conversation and we will figure out that specifics as we go forward. And Chair Saucer, if I yes. could add one piece, I think that it would be good to consider this year as an opportunity to evaluate, not, not needing to track a base on submitting for compensation, but at least with some of the numbers that we've discussed, feeling like it might be on the low end, I, I would appreciate knowing for the next time, having our members who participated be able to say, you know, this is really what, how many hours it took. And so sure. that way we have that type of data moving forward um, if we feel like the compensation that we may decide on this year was, was, was less than fair um, for, our, for our board members participating. I think that's a very valid point to point and something that they could, could the that the members on the committee could individually keep track of themselves. Is that kind of what you're asking at this point? Okay. Right. Yeah, I think that's fair. Is that fair to ask? Yeah. Oh yeah. I yeah. Steve and I and Mary and we'll have a good idea of talking about that. No, very astute observation to go forward. All right. I think that is our end of our lengthy reports and communications <laughs> agenda. We've had to do a lot in this meeting. I, I appreciate the attentiveness of the, the board and the community and administration that's here. We have a few more items left, but first we need to uh, acknowledge a motion of re receipt of reports and communications. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Doyle, second by Coletta. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
it passes. Now on to our administrative action with our Human Resources Director, Mary Ann Thomas, regarding approval of non-renewal termination of prob, I can't talk with this mask name, of probationary teachers. <laughs> My apologies, everything's kind of sticking together. Good evening, Jerry Saucer, members of the school board and the community. Um, tonight, you have before you a resolution regarding the non-renewal of some of our probationary teachers. I was here a couple of months ago and let you know that our administrators were starting the staffing process. You just received an update from Mrs. Huska regarding our budget, and it's all related and intertwined. So. Um, as a result of the principal staffing their buildings, enrollment, all of the things that Ms. Huska spoke about, we do need to non-renew these um, teachers on this list. There's about 30 teachers. About 10 of them are simply because of some licensure issues that their license expires on June 30th and they, may, they have had a special kind of license. So a few of those are gonna get rehired, but they have to, we have to go through this process first. So. And then the other ones, unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to hire all these people back. So it's, it's an unfortunate circumstance, but one that we do have to uh, move forward with. So I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Otherwise, there's a resolution before you. I would ask that you um, approve. Questions? And just to make note, having been briefed on the, on the executive committee, I realized that all these teachers were made aware of this process and kind of counseled through before the names may were made public and they know their status, where, where things are going forward, correct? That's correct. All right, thank you. And the other piece to it is it's what we talked about with the budget is we simply have a lot less students next year and that's, that's part of the difficulty of this motion. So. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the resolution relating to the termination and non-renewal of the teaching contracts of probationary teachers. As Second. Stated. Okay, member, uh, motion by Carrera, second by Coletta. Um, is this a roll call, Lori? No, okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Thomas. All right, the next item is with Mr. Miller. It is awarding the contract for the TLLC window and door replacement. Tiger Learning and, what is it, Legacy and Learning Legacy Center? Legacy and Learning, yep. I still haven't gotten that new name down yet myself. Yep, um, so, so uh, <laughs> thank you, Chair Saucer, members of the board, uh, members of the community. Um, so uh, as you are aware, uh, we did take a uh, replacement window and door project out for bid uh, a while back and I'm extremely pleased uh, to announce that uh, this project uh, also we continue our trend uh, which is which is great for the community uh, came in uh, quite a bit under um, our bid estimates um, by uh, Murphy uh, window and door uh, we have done work with them before um, and so uh, we have experience with them um, being a, a good quality contractor that uh, this type of work specifically with uh, working on older uh, types of building and doing restoration work is is kind of right up their alley. Um, so uh, we're very pleased with that. Um, I guess I, I don't have uh, a whole lot else other than to uh, uh, ask that we uh, approve this uh, contract and, and allow them to, to get going on the work. Uh, in fact, I, I actually met with contractors on site this morning um, because uh, we want to try to keep pushing forward as, as quickly as we can. Uh, supply chains and things like that are likely going to be challenging with this project. So, uh, but we will do our best and, and uh, very pleased to have this come in significantly under bid. Uh, this was not expected. That, that, that says a lot in the current home improvement industry, knowing costs for supplies, especially for lumber right now. So yep. that's, that's a blessing thing for us all. Yep. Are there any questions from board members? Madam Chair, yeah, I have one. On. Dan, when did they say they could, we could expect the work to begin? Um, so uh, so that there's, there's a couple different phases to this. So there is some actual mechanical work uh, that has to be done before we would uh, bring uh, this particular contractor in. And that would start, I believe, um, if I'm getting the date right, I think it might be like June 14th. It's the, uh, we get done with school, then we want to leave a full week 
uh, for custodial staff and teaching staff to be able to get some of the items away from the exterior walls uh, where the windows would be worked on. Uh, and then the mechanical uh, group would come in and we'd give them about two weeks uh, to get started with uh, getting some of the mechanical, some of the radiators and stuff like that moved out of the way um, along the exterior walls in, in a few of the rooms. Uh, and then the hope would be is that we would uh, be in a position to uh, turn this particular contractor loose right around the beginning of July. Um, like I said, we'll, we'll see how materials and stuff like that come in. It, it continues to fluctuate quite a bit in terms of anticipated uh, arrival dates on, on materials. And, and there are two pretty significant different window types of systems that are going in the building. So um, that could could deviate. Um, and it will it will go into the fall. We will not we will not be done when school starts. Um, and so we have prioritized the classrooms. Um, specifically in the newer section of the building, um, that's, that's the priority. We, c we can work around a lot of the other spaces and things like that, so. But the entire building will definitely not be done when school starts. Okay, anything else? Mm -hmm. Right, is there a motion? I'll make a motion to award the PLLC exterior window and door replacement to Murphy window and door for the base bid of $1,276,410 as presented. Second. Motion by Doyle, second by Simmons. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. The bid is awarded. Next item is C, approval of the high school wrestling room waterproofing repairs project. All right. Thank you again, Chair Saucer, member of the board. Um, well, this one also came in under bid because, <laughs> uh, quite frankly, if, it, if we would have uh, known that it would be uh, at this particular level, this would be at a threshold below what we would normally bring to the board. Um, so once again, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so um, our, our uh, uh, engineers did reach out to, the, to this company. Uh, we, do, uh, we do not have any prior experience uh, with the role construction, um, but after their uh, conversations and, and uh, chats with the company and subcontractors and so on and so forth, um, they, we have confidence um, that they can execute uh, the contract and the work um, as is specified in the contract. Uh, and so uh, we would request uh, approval of this contract. Uh, this work would uh, commence immediately after school, uh, would be out here at the high school. Um, this is uh, out on the uh, main student et uh, entrance on the east side of the building. Um, so it will impact a little bit uh, the entrance and exit, but quite honestly, because there are two main entrances and exits uh, there, uh, it'll be of minimal minimal impact uh, to uh, you know pedestrian traffic and so on and so forth. Um, and then that 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 this particular project uh, will be wrapped up uh, early late late July early August. All right. Thank you for all your details. Any additional questions from board members? All right. I would entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to award the 2021 waterproofing repairs above the wrestling room at Farmington High School to do route construction for the base bid of $67,400 as presented. Second. Motion by Simmons, second by Carrero. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion fails. Bid is awarded. Mo motion carries. Oh, motion carries. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to be past my bedtime now. <laughs> All right. Uh, next item on our agenda is our policy actions, and I believe Member Coletta from the Policy Committee has taken that one today? Correct. Thank you. Uh, we, the, the Policy Committee, had met to do reading of Policy 616, which is School District System Accountability, Policy 620, Credit for Learning, and Policy 1017, Graduation Requirements as Presented. We did bring this to the board a couple of meetings ago, so this evening we are looking for a motion to approve those three policies. Are there any questions around those policies? I know we discussed it at our former, or whatever meeting they came to. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. All right, is there a motion to approve the policies? I'll make a motion to adopt policy 616, school district system accountability, policy 620, credit for learning, and policy 1017, graduation requirements as presented. Second. Motion by Doyle, second by Coletta. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 
All right, we're, we're to board remarks already. It feels like it's been a long time since we've done board remarks. I think we're just gonna go around the table. Start with Student Board Member Wong. Let's start with you. Yeah, um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, this has been very long, and given this is my first meeting um, in person, this is definitely something that I will get used to. Um, thank you again for everything, all, all this thought and heart and meaning put into all these different topics, some I understand, some I don't. Um, I'm really excited to continue meeting here and hearing all these different um, different ideas and opportunities for Farmington. You know, we coordinated it to be lecture long just for you. You knew that, right? <laughs> just just teasing. <laughs> I'm just teasing. All right, Member Simmons, is, go ahead. Simmons, I'm going to say it right. <laughs> Well, thanks again to our administration team and for all of the updates tonight. I'm so excited. I can't believe that the end of the school year is just around the corner. I'm, I'm very excited to be participating in the first graduation ceremony as a new board member and for our seniors this year who um, should hopefully have an opportunity to do that in person thanks to the hard work of this group and team. Um, I also am really appreciative of the student updates that I Grace and Alicia, Alicia shared. I really enjoy hearing about those uh, things that are happening within your classes and your grades, and it's um, really, really great to hear about how things are moving forward with all of the things that fill your bucket, so to speak. Um, finally, I'd like to thank my fellow board members again, um, four months in, and just continuing to try and take it all in. Appreciate. Uh, all of you being so supportive and helping me onboard and learn this role. Uh, and also want to give a shout out to our incredible educators. We were talking about our negotiations uh, committee and the work of our board members who are going above and beyond with their time. And I want to recognize and acknowledge that our educators and um, administrative staff are doing that too. And that is no easy feat. And so I thank you all um, as we head into the, the last few weeks of school here. Thank you. Member Doyle. I'm going to kind of echo just some of the same sentiments. It's um, kind of not so we have, what, seven weeks left, something like that. But it's starting, dare I say, knock on wood, to feel like some semblance of normal returning. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's good. And I do really appreciate the work um, of the, the planning for graduation and prom because I do hope we can do um, something for this year's seniors to, to really get them in person and make it uh, meaningful for them. But, uh, yeah, in the interest of time, I'll keep it at that. Member Farrow. Yes, I echo everything you guys are saying. And <laughs> I'll tell you that I look forward to our comments from our uh, student school board members. Again, you guys educate me on what's going on, and I appreciate that within the community. Uh, there's just a couple things I wanted to bring up <coughs> that's been going on in the community. Excuse me. So the first one was there was the impression out there, well, first of all, there's a, a senior boat cruise going on that parents that got a hold of me and staff members were told that uh, mm -hmm. We, the school district, supported it. That is not true. Um, I know Mr. Pickens has been in several calls and emails on it. Um, we do know the staff member that's kind of heading it up. I'm a little disappointed in that individual because it's against everything that they were trying to do as a district. Um, I will say to those parents, um, please be careful because I know there's no restrictions for the kids to wear masks because I did call the place to find out what was going on. Um, I do also ask the parents to talk to their kids and ask them if this is something they really want to do. My daughter's a senior <clears throat> in college, so she's missing out on stuff as well, but I turn that over to her as a life lesson. So, and it's tough to talk about, excuse me. <laughs> so I had senior day this past weekend, which was nice, um, but it wasn't like her freshman year for the senior class. She missed out on a lot, and it's her senior year. She's done with college. She's done with her, her college career with athletics. Um, she's moving on, so we're missing out too as parents. Um, so I feel what parents are going through, but remember, you do this for the kids. You don't do this for the parents. We all fall into that category that, you know, we want the best for our kids, but I'll use my daughter as an example. My daughter thought I was crazy when I said, do you want me to talk to anybody? You want to see if we can do something different? Um, I can't tell you what she told me, um, but, she was very understanding, very sensible, very reasonable. So I encourage those parents that are 
their kids are going on this cruise to be smart about it. That's all. Because if one kid gets it, others can get it. And now, watching the news today, I see we had another death in Minnesota. So that makes uh, four students now that have died of, of COVID. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was the student walkout that happened last week. Um, first of all, I was appalled at some of the comments on Facebook that people forwarded me about Mr. Pickens. Um, that's fine sharing emails and stuff, but you need to know that I was here for that because I wanted to actually see what went on. It was a smooth transition. There was kids out there. Kids were having a good time. Kids were being kids. Parents, you need to be parents. I think if parents would step back and let the kids understand what's going on, which they do, um, they respected everybody. They handled the situation very well. Um, I went over to Bachman and, and met our uh, uh, assistant principal for the first time and talked to him about how it went at Bachman. I miss Chris over there. Um, that went very well as well. So again, I encourage parents, um, before you really jump on the bandwagon and go after administration, come and talk to them, get educated. It's easy sitting behind a computer and, and typing stuff. Have the conversation with our administration on that. I spent you know, an hour and a half out here with, with Mr. Pickens because I was appalled at some of the comments. My, I have friends that even sent comments that I talked to about it. Um, so that's all I have to say about that. I just encourage parents to let kids be kids and parents parent. Um, our kids are smarter than we think. So. Member Pagan. Um, yeah, I would just like to um, thank, um, especially Mr. Dr. and Mrs. Pagan, for doing um, everything possible to um, do things uh, safely, but still um, in a fun manner for our seniors, especially from a student perspective. It's nice to see that whereas they could have just thrown their hands up in the air and said, you know, it's too hard this year. We're not going to try to take the risk. Um, we have Pickens talking about three different dates that might work and contingency plan after contingency plan and just any way possible to make some sense of normalcy for the seniors. I just know that it is um, significantly appreciated. So I just wanted to take a second to thank you guys for that. So thank you. All right, Member Carlotta. I would also like to say the same thing. Thank you, Mr. Bussman and Mr. Pickman and uh, Pickens. Um, for all the work going into that because I know last year was really hard on our seniors and you know what they made lemonade out of those lemons they were given and I really enjoyed sitting at home watching the graduation so I'm really grateful that that's going to be online again for a lot of family members that aren't in state I think that's I think it's a wonderful thing we're going to continue to do and uh, I wish I could go to prom because I'd love to see all those kids listening to different music and all their little dance styles. I'd love to, I'd love to go and yeah, that would be a fun time to just look and see how everybody's dancing and getting along. So um, really grateful that that's happening for the seniors and the juniors. Um, I'd like to personally thank board member Steve Carrero and board member Jacqueline Doyle for the time that you put into the negotiation and sitting on those boards because I, I know it's been a lot of time and you guys did volunteer your time and you know you both have families and and other commitments through the board so thank you very much for your dedication on that and um, just look forward to making progress with the district I truly believe that we are in one of the best districts in the country and we all have our bumps in the road but I'm so proud of Farmington and I tell people what we do here and they just can't believe it. And um, so that says a lot to our district administration team. And thank you very much for all you do in the district office for these kids and for our district. All right, thank you. So I think I heard Mr. Pickens, we have a, we have a volunteer for prom if you need any extra results. <laughs> Member Claudia is there. <laughs> Absolutely. Also, one thing I've noticed that this last year has caused us all to stretch our thinking. And I know when talking with Superintendent Berg, he's been like, you know, it's kind of nice because we have to think outside of the box to be able to function right now. And some of the things uh, that have been created to make things work this year, but I think we've learned from it. For example, having graduation online is something that I would assume from now on would continue going forward. You know, one thought I had looking at the graduation piece, you know, talking about the different outdoor times, maybe that's something we consider in the future as well because people want to be able to invite as many as they can and this is the different processes 
we're looking at with a, just a different set of framework, I think is valid. And when we finally get through this process of this pandemic and the parameters that we're living under, I think it is time to evaluate, you know, what did work? What did work better? What things can be modified and changed? I think it could be a hybrid of past traditions current traditions or what we've had to do and then maybe a mix of that in the future with what works so I, I think that i think that's kind of exciting of how we've made things work and best for everyone because of the constraints but i think we've learned a lot from it and i like to see that that growth that the district has made speaking of growth um i appreciate member simmons talking about asking questions and kind of having patience with you and like please don't hesitate as any member of the board new old i don't say old more experience, don't be afraid to ask a question anytime because I want everyone to have that opportunity to have the discussion, have those questions asked, and continue to feel comfortable. And if you're not comfortable, come to me first and we'll figure out a way to address it. But it, that's very important to me and I think it's very important to have that open discussion as a board. And just a couple highlights. Um, I appreciate the student updates. Congratulations again to secretary, is that what it was? Yep. That's huge, that's super exciting. And I appreciate all that you guys are bringing forward as student board members. I was able to attend the, tang the 12 Angry Men play, and it was incredible. Just blown away the depth of, uh, just the, let alone, I can't think of the words right now, but just how much script they had to memorize and learn. And so current, so the current events that are going on right now, I have to admit, with the current events are going on with the trials and everything, just having that kind of insight of what it would be like in a jury room, I think was just very timely and just amazing to see the talent and such a difficult content to put to across. Also this weekend, I'm excited that Cabaret is happening in person for families that have students attending and part of that. So I'm excited to be able to go and see that. They're using a children's choir component as well this year. So I actually get to watch my daughter sing, so I'm excited about that. And also music, uh, musical auditions are coming up as well in a couple of weeks. They announced it's gonna be The Little Mermaid, which I think is neat, and they're also allowing um, a children's core with that too. So it's kind of a way to incorporate a lot of involvement in the district and not just at the high school level, which I like seeing. So lots we've covered, it's been a long meeting. I appreciate your patience tonight. They're not always this long. And the fact that we had to have an abbreviated meeting last time kind of just added to the length of the meeting tonight. So. Thank you for your patience. Um, we will need to, the next item of business is to close for this, the, labor de, the labor negotiation strategy and I would like to make a recommendation that we take a brief recess and just Superintendent Berg quick, has sure, something. Sasser, just yes. want to remind our community that when we come out of closed session, yes. the only thing we will do is adjourn because the video is, we're not gonna fire up the video again. Yes, just to clarify, when we do go to close, as Superintendent Berg says, the only item of business we have is to close the meeting. So that is what we will be doing per statute. And I'm just recommendation of five minute recess between as well. Is there a motion? Mm -hmm. Second. Motion by Carrero, second by Doyle. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Five minute recess, everyone. Thank you.